It looks like we may have a quorum, so why don't we get started? Can we take the roll, please? For all Liz? Mahan? Here. Esparza? Here. Carrasco? Foley? Here. Thank you. Okay, great. This is the Community and Economic Development Committee. If that's the committee you want to be in on, then you're at the right spot. Today we have a, a couple of things on the agenda and one we're taking off of the agenda. The first item is to review the work plan and we have a recommendation to drop the item related to electronic billboards from this work plan. So, um, Rosalind, did you want to go into some background as to why that is, uh, why we are considering that today? Certainly. Thank you so much, Council Member Chair Foley, Rosalind Huey, Deputy City Manager. Uh, yes, as staff indicated um, in our memo to rules, uh, we are in the process of wrapping up the negotiations around the RFP that was issued, um, but are have not yet uh, finalized that. Uh, and until it's finalized, it would be inappropriate to bring it to discuss it um, at CED. Uh, so we'll be wrapping up this work and getting it to council after the first of the year. Great, thank you. And I also understand that the last time it take went to council is that it was council's directive that it go directly back to council and not through CED. Is that correct? Well, we've actually, we've, uh, this work's been underway for quite some time. We've actually already presented uh, to CED. Uh, it was probably uh, pre-pandemic, uh, but yes, that's correct. We're now ready to go to the full council for their final action. Okay, very good, thank you. Council Member Perales, would you like to speak now or after any public comment we may have on this issue? We can wait till after the public comment. Okay, great. Let's go to public comment then. Uh, we have one speaker, Blair Beekman. Blair, if you could stay on topic of the electronic billboards and being sure. pulled off the agenda. Sure, I will. Uh, thank you, Blair Beekman here. I wanted to try to quickly comment uh, about this item. Uh, it's an item that, that can make a lot of people uncomfortable and it sounds like you know you're going to be doing some more retooling on it and try to come back in January. I hope that when you do, it can be a process of more um, uh, to the council. It will be a process of, of open dialogue, and that uh, instead of having final answers for things, it should be a place of, of further public discussion and dialogue. I hope uh, that can happen and. Uh, Good luck how you go about in talking about uh, this issue for our future. Um, thank you. Great, thank you. No uh, further hands are raised. So, oops, I'm sorry. There is a uh, speaker 5140, Michael Sincini. Again, we're talking about electronic billboards. Yeah, just what we need, more electricity. Uh, being used when you know you yourself want everything to go all electric no natural gas we want all electric cars how much more electricity do we have to use we're talking about electronic billboards and taking yeah, it off of this calendar I'm about, Pam, Pam I'm talking about that don't interrupt me don't interrupt me back to count back to the committee uh, Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, and I know there, uh, obviously we got this update as well. I'd asked a question at rules last week on when this would come back. Um, I was getting some questions for that first um, NOIA that was, was announced back in July. Um, I know that, um, you know, they're now, we're now waiting to hear back now mid-November mid uh, uh, as responses, but I'm curious if staff has uh, engaged with the awardees for the July um, notice of intended award on the alternative sites uh, that they're 
um, and, and if they're providing any updates to those awardees since those bids won't come to council until uh, quarter one now of, of um, 2022. So thanks for the question, Councilmember Perales, uh, Blagi Zalalich with the Office of Economic Development. And so we have, have not um, engaged uh, to any like substantial degree yet, quite honestly, because we're trying to manage um, a, a few things around both this process and workload. Uh, but the intention was uh, and is, and we will be doing um, a follow-up this week now that we went to rules uh, with the update from this committee and what we were doing with this update and, and provide them with the um, new timeline. And we're also getting kind of the appropriate staff on the city side involved to be able to um, bring, bring forward all the things that we need to bring forward to council. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I'll, if there hasn't been a motion, I'll move to approve the work plan. Great, second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Then let's vote. Perales? Yes. Carrasco? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Foley? Aye. Thank you. Great, thank you. The next item is a consent item, the review of the Housing and Community Development Commission annual accomplishments and uh, work plan. Does anyone, uh, doesn't there, uh, we don't have a presentation because it is a consent item. There is one public comment, Blair. Your hand was raised last time. Is it on this item too? Yeah, it is actually. Okay. Um, I didn't know this was a consent, but uh, yeah, I'd, be, I'd very much like to speak on this item. Um, thank you for this report. Um, it's important you're considering affordable siting, affordable housing siting ideas. Um, I hope when you do that, you won't be losing track of the importance of uh, mixed income ideas. And I, I, I just think mixed income offers an incredible flexibility to how it can address all income levels and all income levels can start to be living together in, in neighborhoods and to learn how to plan for that. Uh, the affordable siting, housing siting things are doing that. Um, but I, I just hope, I, I just, I think we need to create a way that it can be, we can learn how to talk about mixed, um, mixed income more open, openly. And uh, that's an important goal uh, for myself. I, I keep mentioning it here. And uh, you just finalized some MTC housing work at the regional level. And I, I hope uh, the same thing, that you can learn just to simply talk about mixed income ideas that you already have planned for and know how to do. And it's just a matter of getting down to it. And I hope uh, it becomes a more public process because I think its ideas are, are really good. Um, we have to really be considering ELI and VLI. Um, Council Person Mayhem's ideas, they were kind of, uh, you know, made fun of a bit, but I, he's on the right track that we're all trying to address better housing issues this fall. And and with so much uh, subsidy money coming in, you know, I, I, hope, I hope we're starting to know how to uh, use that money well for programs that we already do well. And uh, I think that can be of a lot of help and service. And uh, uh, to learn how to talk about those issues about subsidies openly with ourselves and the public and community. Uh, that's an important concept that can be difficult for us, but we're learning how to do that. And uh, good luck what we can be doing this fall and into next year with these sorts of issues. Thank you. Next is caller 5140, Michael Sincini. HCD annual accomplishments and work plan. As I read through the plan, I'm wondering where all this money is going to come from in the future. I mean, uh, you guys, uh, your, your dear leader, Biden, he's going to be dumping a bunch of money on you for being the good comrades that you are. But, you know, when that money dries up, is this county, city, and state going to be able to fund and repair and maintain and, and, and give housing to people who have nothing? And then there's opportunity for people who have money. I think that it's misguided. You're going to run out of money, and it's in all you're going to have. It's going to look like a bad Eastern European country with just you know uh, 
bad cinder block buildings with people hanging out the window. I mean, it's going to look terrible. There's no such thing as affordable right now in the inflation. All of you know it's awful. You can thank uh, Biden, your dear comrade, for the incredible inflation that we're having. I, mean, I went out for a drink and a cup of, or a bowl of soup today. It was $22. But you mean to tell me that uh, there's going to be an affordable house or a bowl of soup in this town is $22? And that's at the Vietnamese spa places that are usually affordable. You know, you go to a fancy place, forget it. So you're going to tell me you're going to make affordable housing for people? I don't think so. What does it cost per person? The way you guys spend money, the cost per person, we can put people up in the old uh, Fairmont Hotel. That I don't know when you guys are going to reopen that. I really think that should become the homeless shelter and a police station, and a marijuana dealing place. You guys can have it all in one. All your money, all your homeless people, your beloved uh, law enforcement, they can all be there together in that, in that big, big housing project that's going to be the, uh, the Fairmont Hotel, uh, the Welfare Hotel. That's what it's going to be someday. Guaranteed, no one's going to buy that place. Who's, who's going to stay in San Jose? Who wants to come to this town? Homeless people everywhere. You guys should be ashamed of yourselves how you run this town. And I just want to say a couple things here. Let's go, Brandon. Okay, next is Tessa Woodmansee. Again, we're talking about the Housing Community Development Commission work plan and accomplishments. Oh. Thank you so much. Oh, I really appreciate that, Pam. You're reviewing the topic. But it was so wonderful to hear, um, you know, when I first came in, uh, Blair speaking, and I understood the topic and just really appreciated what Blair was saying and always do appreciate what he says. And, um, you know, just what I've been talking about is a housing issue. And I've been thinking about it in regards to my neighborhood because I'm fighting the hotel because the hotel is a symbol of not addressing our housing crisis. And that's where we had signs all over our neighborhood. We want housing, not hotels. We want neighbors, not transients. And we won that first battle. We won the first battle and we saved a beautiful Victorian. And actually the neighbors are living in the, the owners of this property of the two, two lots on Stockton and, and Chile um, is li are living in the beautiful Victorian. So, and with his family, and it's so nice to have a family living on Stockton Avenue because when we came here, it was a commercial area, but it was originally, then it was going to go housing. And then you changed it and said, everything has to be about jobs and hotels are the ones that bring money, the most money to our city. So let me get into my housing vision. So my housing vision for this property that's in my neighborhood and my, my vision is always to make the world a better place. And so what I say is that we build housing there. We build three buildings with three stories and a basement. And it's, it's no cement and that's, we can do it. And it's no carbon you know, dioxide. And then we get homeless to live with teachers that are invited. So we get not, we won't call them homeless, let's call them unhoused. And the, un, the people who have been living unsustainably, which is all of us on the planet, we need to learn to live sustainably on this planet. So it's an education program to teach them how to live sustainably. And they grow food, the three buildings that can house 37 homeless and 37 teachers of sustainability. And when they live together, and this is how we can build a new way of living on our... Okay, last speaker on this topic is Brendan, I'm sorry, Brenda Doman. Hi, yes. Um... I'm, I'm calling in to speak about COPA and TOPA. I'm not sure if this is the right time. This is, to this is not. That is later on the agenda. This okay. is the housing, housing work plan. So uh, we, you can raise your hand when we get to that item in two items. How about that? Perfect. Great. Thank you. Moving back to the committee, Council Member Perales, you have your hand raised. Did you have questions about this? I'm sorry. That was from before. Would you like to make a motion? Yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar. Great, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, if there's no further discussion, let's poll. Let's vote. Perasco? Aye. Perales? Yes. Mahan? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Foley? Aye. Thank you. Thank you.
Now on to the reports uh, to the committee. We have a verbal report from the Econo economic activities report from Elizabeth. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you, Chair Foley and committee members. Um, Elizabeth Handler, Public Information Manager for the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. Um, I'm, I've changed the format a little bit of the report to you because when we switched to a quarterly report process, I was pretty sure you wouldn't want to sit through three SJ Economy news issues in a row. So what I've done is pulled out the key um, elements that do uh, represent activities for the uh, for the quarter, and this format also allows me to include news releases um, as well as the blog posts and newsletter items that we've been um, publishing. So the first one is a um, video that is the second in the series that we are producing on survival of businesses in San Jose through the COVID pandemic and beyond. This is another restaurant concept. It, at this point, it's a pop-up concept called Het Se, which means awesome in Vietnamese. And it is um, showing up in wonderful places like the, uh, the event for the opening of the dog park and um, pocket park on, in Sofa. They catered that. And they're also um, on Saturdays at the farmer's market in the Rose Garden. So I suggest um, people go visit them because their food is amazing. It's awesome, as a matter of fact. Um, this is the Santa Clara University Business and Law Schools um, are cooperating to provide on um, live interaction consultations and free support for both business and legal advice for small businesses. They did it uh, once in September, they did it again in October, and we've been promoting that and supporting that as well. You may not be aware that the first week of October, um, as it has been for many years, was Manufacturing Week in the United States. And in San Jose, that banner is held high for us by the Manufacture San Jose Group, our partners uh, supporting the manufacturing sector in the city which is such a critical element of our economy. And they hosted a very interesting webinar that is available on their website uh, on sustainable manufacturing. You may know that OED has started working with the flea market vendors as part of the city's support for uh, the flea market vendors during the transition um, that is happening as the site is undergoing develop the development process. Um, even though it's two years in the future when they might have to be moving, we're working with them right now. And in fact, we had pop-ups um, at the flea markets two weekends, this most recent one and the one before that. This most recent one also included members of our housing department, um, eviction moratorium and rent relief team who were at the flea market sharing information helping to sign up people for um, appointments to help with rent relief and doing it all in three languages. And it's, it's, a, it's a great program and we were really proud to be there. We uh, are happy to be promoting the fact that the California Rebuilding Fund is now offering small business loans. Um, and so we're promoting that again through our blog posts and uh, webinars in multiple languages. We had uh, an amazing public artwork um, unveiled the Mineta San Jose International um, Airport with this, 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 this I, I, it's almost indescribable. I suggest you go to see the video <laughs> and check it out. But it's a clock that is made up of, of hundreds of clock spaces that make different shapes as the time goes by. And it's very exciting. Then most of the folks here were part of our celebration uh, for the opening of the third Duncan um, in San Jose at the corner of Foxworthy and Almaden Expressway. Um, very happy to have that corner that I think all of us driving down Almaden Expressway have been looking at for years, wondering what's going to go in that cute little building they built. Well, it's a Duncan, and they also made a nice $1,000 donation 
to Second Harvest, which was um, a fun part of that event. So with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Wonderful, thank you. And that third Duncan is in District 9, I'm happy to say. Uh, okay, let's go to members of the public who may have comments uh, about the economic activities report. Tessa. Thank you very much for always um, re repeating what the topic is. Thank you, Pam. And um, uh, anyway, yeah, I was thinking about our economic development and, and when you look at what's happened in terms of so, and like, like Michael was, was referring to, you know, so much of our money has come from the uh, federal government. And when we look at that, that money, 2% uh, of it went for green businesses. And so when we're, what we need to be celebrating is fossil fuel free businesses. That's what we need to be um, supporting. And we see that the damages as we are coming out of a, um, uh, you know, a bomb, a bomb cyclone that hit the Bay Area, you know, and this is what we're facing with, you know, is climate change. And so what we really need to do is our actions have to start really being in the line with the science. And it's really creating fossil fuel free jobs. So that that's where what I'm talking about, and we talk about with homelessness, that we're going to put them to work to clean our city. They don't need to, uh, uh, cleaning is okay. But the, the real job we need to have is for them to learn to grow food. And actually, uh, historically, I was having a talk with the head of the Sierra Club, and he was saying in, in Cuba, that, that started making a lot of money. As, as you know, in, for Cuba, when they cut off the gas in, from Russia, where there was some issue with that, and the history, I'm not sure, but you know, you can look it in. Anyway, the, the ones who made the most money were the ones who were making food or growing food. And that's where we need to go. That needs to be our future. And that's what Allery Middlebrook, who's working actually with the Parks and Rec, as she has a vision for 25 by 25, which is the eco villages. And that's what we have over at the Agra Hood. And those are the jobs that she is creating um, in her, her nonprofit now, her pro nonprofit of urban sustainability, and actually has spoke to one of her members and is interested in, in living with the homeless and, and becoming the educator and living in that type of scenario. She's 24, and that's our future is fossil fuel. Thank you. Next caller, 5140, Mr. Sonsini. Well, it looks like you guys are finally focusing on real issues versus flavored tobacco or something, which, you know, that's not good economic development, regulating a taxable item that goes into the public coffers. But that's another story. Yeah, I, I hope that uh, you start reducing regulations and allowing these type of pop up things. I mean, how many I mean, all of a sudden when you guys had to, it was OK to eat on a patio or create a parklet or serve alcohol. Oh no, serve alcohol. Don't do that, right? A beer is a big deal in this town. I mean, I, I, I could go on for hours of what a big deal this city and this county makes about somebody having a beer at a bar or buying one in a liquor store. You, I mean, this is like a puritanical society gone mad with like leftist ideals. But yeah, you guys need to get back to the basics. You need to start making sure that you don't have to have 25 sheets of paper posted in your window of your restaurant to be able to have a parklet. You guys are crazy. You guys need to, to, to get rid of the regulations, which I know you like, Pam. You like the regulations, right? I mean, you guys want to dictate how, how tall a flagpole can be in someone's yard or how a how a We're talking about the economic activities, activities report. Yeah, this is the this is economics, Pam. Regulation is part of making economics good or bad, and you know that. You know the more regulations that you have, you guys are going to have less business. And the way you guys run this town with all your little stupid rules, you're not going to have the economic development. It's not going to happen because you guys don't want it. You guys want to just hand out the money and be superheroes. You don't want to really lift anybody up by a small business. You don't want to do that. You, you want to take a small business like a smoke shop and put them out of business when they're generating revenue. You guys are taking money from, from these small businesses that sell tobacco and alcohol and everything. That, if you guys are going to control that, what else won't you do? Hey, you know who started uh, regulating smoking and, and all that? Hitler. 
Well, that took a weird twist. Okay, uh, Mr. Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, I guess uh, there are two, from your attachment, there are two items that speak to, uh, um, well, first I'll start with the uh, San Jose Manufacturing uh, Week of 2021. Um, this is uh, uh, where, you know, uh, different uh, technologies can come in to play data collection ideas. The use of AI, you know, and I've been trying, I don't quite know the language, but I think there's ways that uh, the future of AI this fall can be a more open, accessible, democratic uh, process. And we can better consider the, co the concepts of civil rights and civil protections in the data collection of, of AI at this time. And, and it's just, it's a heartfelt plea and a ask that, and I think we all want to work towards those ideals this fall. Good luck how we can do that and in and, and this sort of convention and they can talk about these sort of things. Um, there's a business uh, support uh, for uh, the flea market and, and business, well, there's business support for small businesses at Santa Clara University. They can get advice and help about COVID issues along with loan issues, uh, small business loan issues. Thank you for those efforts. There is a uh, an issue about the uh, vendors at the flea market, if I can get this right, you're offering some sort of uh, loan system for them or rent relief for them. Um, that's more like it, not loan, but rent relief. Um, you know, there's an issue going on that about they have to pay six months in advance uh, for things and, uh, you know, to, to, to keep on working there, to, to have a place there. That's questionable. That's They may not have the money to do that. And so I suppose this program can be of some rent relief help. Good luck in how uh, to work on this issue and, and all sides can come to good agreements. And uh, uh, thanks for allowing myself public comment time on these things. Thank you. No further public comment. So back to the committee, Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair, uh, and appreciate the the update. Um, uh, in, in the newsletter, uh, you mentioned uh, setting up shop to help uh, the various uh, flea market vendors association and currently have uh, a challenge right now with the vendors and their licensing uh, agreement or their, their leases that were discussed over the summer um, in an attempt to try and provide more of uh, more longer leases of six months. And I'm just curious if I, I know we've already engaged with our city attorney's office and with OED um, to see how we can help facilitate those uh, this this current um, debate that's going on or, or, or concern. So I just want to see, is there anything uh, else that OED may be uh, planning to do um, within those discussions? I can jump in on that, Council Member. Thank you very much. Um, City Attorney's Office had um, shared that the mechanism is a license and that's what was specified in the council approval. I think there was a little confusion about that, but nonetheless, the license was the term. And the city attorney has been very clear that the city cannot be come between a, a landlord and a tenant. So the six month option is, um, only available to them if they pay all six months, which we agree is very, very difficult and probably not gonna happen for pretty much anyone. Um, so the month rent uh, monthly is still there with the promise that the um, vendors will not um, interrupt uh, those who are there as long as they're fulfilling flea market rules. So the basic monthly lease, lease continues to be there and so in discussions with the bums, they, they are of the view that they have full intention that that has been what has been in place for 60 years and that is what will be. So from their point of view, they believe that can work. But legally, we have asked um, for some outside help to review the current lease council member um, to see if some sort of um, assistance for the flea market vendors can come through that venue. Um, 
and just waiting to see if there is anything there and that wouldn't be from the city at that point. Okay, um, if you can just, and it doesn't have to be to the full committee, but I'd, I'd be interested just in an update as, as that conversation continues and appreciate uh, OED stepping in where, um, where you can. Um, and then I just wanted to see if there was any uh, specific update in regards to plans for um, uh, the holidays in downtown. Lage will be the, there she is. You're on mute. No. Well, I'm happy to step in and, and answer that. Yes, there are plans for holidays downtown, which is great after having uh, kind of last year's semi hiatus. So uh, we're happy to know that the outdoor seasonal ice rink, downtown ice is coming back, um, that Christmas in the park is doing something both downtown and the park. Um, bringing Christmas in the park back, but then also um, continuing the new tradition they established last year with the drive-through, uh, Blinky's drive-through illumination. So that's great. We'll have that activation in, in two locations in our city. And then also um, Winter Wonderland coming back in a reduced format along the Paseo de San Antonio, um, uh, you know, kind of spoke as a spoke off of, of Christmas in the park, obviously with some of the construction that's happening on Park Avenue. Um, they're not able to have their full footprint, uh, but they are working um, to, to pop up in, in some different areas of the, of the downtown core. So we're excited about that. We're also working on uh, hopefully some video projection, video mapping on the cathedral as we had last year um, and illumination along a few different corridors in the downtown, kind of guiding people um, around and about downtown. And then there are a number of different um, kind of cu cultural organizations that are also doing their performances. And, um, and we'll have, of course, Sonic Runway at, at City Hall Plaza. That will be another really great kind of illumination um, project and so there there will be a lot of uh, lights and hopefully a lot of bustling in the downtown core over the holiday season. Great, thank you. Yeah, we're looking forward to um, you know some um, reinvigoration of of downtown the, during the holiday season. Certainly missed that last year and um, appreciate uh, OED's work in in helping to. Uh, create active areas and spaces in Blage, um, your leadership in the downtown core. And so we're looking forward to hopefully uh, the holidays being uh, a nice resurgence for us here in, in downtown. Thanks. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll make approval of the uh, verbal report. Second. Great. Thank you. Elizabeth, you have your hand raised. I just wanted to, um, to point out Blair had a question about rent relief and whether that related to rent of the, the flea market vendors. Um, booth at the flea market, and it doesn't. It's residential rent relief that we and, and the housing department are, are um, advocating for folks to apply for. Okay, thank you. Council Member Esparza. Thanks. I actually just wanted to follow up on that uh, Christmas in the park. The uh, drive through Blage is at Lake Cunningham. Is that correct? Yeah, for folks correct. in the community that are not aware. Correct. Great, great. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. That was going to be my question. So let's let's vote. Oh, chair, I can't put. This is Magdalena. Can I? Oh, can I have a couple of minutes. Sure, I can't put course. up my hand for whatever reason. Sure, um, of course. So be, before we vote, uh, thank you for for the report. Uh, I, a couple of things I just wanted to ask. When uh, when doing these these shout outs and, and reporting back to us. On the on the activities that are going on, I mean, I love seeing what what's been happening. Have a, I, I, I guess it's a more of a request to have uh, some of our bi minority businesses um, showcased and being been given the same kind of platform. There's a, a beautiful event that's about to happen this weekend uh, in La Calle de los Altares which is a day of the dead celebration. And it's really, a, it's become a very organic 
uh, placemaking and a way to to showcase not just uh, the cultural traditions. Beautiful, it's, by the way, it's a beautiful, beautiful event. Um, I'm extending the invitation to anyone that has an opportunity to come through. It's actually one of my my most favorite. It's just so beautiful, but it's also an opportunity to to really promote those businesses up along the Alamo corridor who have been hit so tragically by COVID and the shutdown. Uh, so I'm just wondering if we could extend some of the, this reporting uh, outside of the, the core of San Jose. I think that's a great idea. Make sure that we focus on businesses all over the city. Love that. Thank you very much, Nancy Klein. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Nancy, go ahead. Thank you. Um, we can also touch base to, to the council member's point with Office of Cultural Affairs and make sure we have a recap uh, of activities so that you have that included in the report and that will go out in the push on all our social media. So thank you for the suggestion. Thank you. Great. Council member Esparza, you have thank your you. hand raised. Is that yeah. a new? Okay. Yeah, I, I raised it. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I actually, uh, Nancy, I, I, I'm don't want to put uh, words in Council Member Carrasco's mouth, but it would be great if in the future we could promote those activities. For example, the Dia de los Muertos that she's referring to, I think last year brought brought um, a, a lot of um, cars into that business corridor. Uh, but as the holidays approach, um, we're fortunate to, I know everybody's excited to bring Christmas in the park back downtown. I am. Um, I've even threatened to learn how to roller skate or how to ice skate, um, which we'll see. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there are going to be some amazing things happening all over the city that we can promote um, and not just report sort of after the fact, but to make sure that that goes in the newsletter as it goes out um, ahead of time. That's it for me. Thanks. Thank you. If I could just add one one thing uh, to the to the holiday promotions. Part of what we're doing is working with our um, our entity that promotes San Jose, which is Team San Jose, and they are going to be transforming as they did last year. They'll have um, San Jose for the holidays, and so we're gonna we're going to feed a lot of the promotion and, and events information to the San Jose. Uh, for the holidays page on sanjose.org and they will also be pushing out um, that information into the vast expanse and into the public. Love it. Thank you, Blogge. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank One you. One last comment, Chair. Sure. Uh, and, uh, lastly, I just wanted to say, you know, I, I appreciate uh, small and big companies are, are making San Jose their home and they're contributing and, and uh, really um, uh, providing for the local economy, uh, as well as uh, making sure that our, our residents are, are, are working and they can continue feeding their families. Uh, did I hear correctly that Dunkin' Donuts had made a donation? That, that I see Chair Foley saying yes. I and, believe and, it was $1,000 to Second Harvest Food Bank. Yeah, that's fantastic, fantastic. And of course, we want to highlight that. I, I, I want to point out just what some of our small businesses have been doing during this pandemic, during you know the most difficult time for some of these families. Uh, I have a small business, very small, by the way, very small, uh, and she's been uh, widely successful. I, I took our city manager to go have lunch there the other day so she could kind of get a flavor for the east side of San Jose. And the owner, even though she's a single mom with two children, starting this business uh, has been uh, pretty successful on the east side. She, she was amazing in making sure that our families were fed. Uh, I believe it was once a week or twice a week from 10 a.m. to 12. She was, uh, she was uh, her entire menu or whatever it is that she was creating, she was creating it for people who, who need it, who, who were in, in need at the time. And so for many, many months, she was feeding uh, unbeknownst to me, by the way, I had no idea, but she was providing free plates for anyone that lined up from 10 to 12. And, uh, you know, it doesn't amount to a cash contribution to a nonprofit, but she herself uh, contributed her own uh, profits and 
uh, her own labor to make sure that the folks in our community were fed. On Cinco de Mayo, the entire proceeds went to, uh, to back into the community. Uh, I mean, I can go on and on, but to be able to highlight what some of these small businesses who don't have corporate backing uh, have been doing to make sure that our communities are well taken care of. I think it's, uh, I, again, I'd love to be able to see that kind of promotion uh, happening um, for our small businesses. Council Member Carrasco, I really appreciate you bringing that up. It's really important that we support our small businesses as much as we possibly can. I happened to be at a local bakery in District 9 uh, last week and uh, they had a little sign, if you contribute, we will make, we make cakes for unhoused uh, children, birthday cakes. So they take them over to the shelters and they celebrate their birthday by baking a cake for them. I thought that was really wonderful. So we're gonna do, we do a Saturday shout out, uh, social media shout out for small businesses. So we're gonna shout out that to our community as well. So anything we can do, I know we will as council offices, but on a, on a bigger scale, if the city can push that information out too, it's really helpful to our small businesses and shows how much our small businesses are really dedicating to dedicating to keeping employees and running their business and paying their bills and doing what they need to to survive, but also to help the community as best they can. So it's really, really kind of exciting. So um, I see it, uh, Blage, you have a hand raised. So I just let, wanted to follow up on your comment, okay. just to say if you all could help us when you know about, I mean, that's a wonderful thing. Like, that's awesome that they do the birthday cakes. So it's really difficult for us to know kind of all the things that are happening in kind of the nooks and crannies of our large city. So to the extent that you all find out in, in council offices about these really, you know, wonderful um, uh, situations or occurrences, or you know about holiday activities happening in your district or the organizations that are doing them, please send a contact, a note to Nancy or Elizabeth or to myself. And then we'll follow up and then we can push it out into our larger um, social media. So right. thank you for, for helping us out. We will do that. With that, let's vote and then move on to the last item, which I think is the one that's going to generate some conversation. Roscoe? Aye. Perales? Yes. Mahan? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Foley? Aye. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Last item is the Community Opportunity to Purchase Program uh, Draft Guidelines Report. This is an update. Jackie, are you making this presentation? I am going to be making it uh, with Kristen Clements. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Great. So, um, I'm Jackie morales Rand. I'm the Director of Housing for the City of San Jose, and I'm joined today by Kristen Clements, who is our Division Manager. Um, and we're here to talk to you about the Community Opportunity to Purchase Program, which is COPA, affectionately known as COPA. And it's not working. <laughs> oh, there it goes. All right. So, um, the first thing is to provide context regarding what is COPA and, COPA. and the definition is that it gives qualified nonprofit organizations an opportunity to make our, the first offer on a rental property before it's put on the market. And it's also a right to make a final offer to match any conditions or price points that a, someone else subsequently might make if the a uh, seller decides not to take the COPA offer to begin with from the nonprofit. So uh, how did we end up here with a COPA program? We just wanted to remind you that COPA came out of the work that the housing department did with our anti-displacement strategy. It was actually one of our priority projects to be working on. And we took this to council in September of 2020, you all approved that plan. And so uh, we have been working on this um, to bring this forward. 
Uh, it was also part of the community's displacement strategy report that uh, the housing department worked uh, collaboratively with our residents on. So it's one of the key elements to the plan. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Kristen, who will walk you through more of the details on COPA. Mike, can you move Kristen over to a panelist? I see that she's an attendee. Yes, can you... just a second. Yeah. Okay, no worries. Thank you. Christian, just unmute okay. yourself and, and she's coming over. Man. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Thanks. Life in uh, in remote land. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, uh, COPA has the goal of improving resident stability by providing income restricted affordable housing. And it seeks to improve market opportunities in part of the real estate market that apparently is not very transparent. The quote on the left indicates one reason that COPA is needed. San Jose has a strong underlying real estate market despite COVID. The quote on the left is about our multifamily market from last fall and that investors still see San Jose rental housing as a desired investment and a place where higher and higher rents can be obtained. When you see value add, that means that a core strategy for buyers is to raise rents and generate more revenues. So, however, when buildings, sorry, previous slide, when buildings sell and rents increase, residents are stressed and they're more prone to leave that may or may not um, be shown in evictions data. They just may um, owe back rent and leave before they owe any more. Evictions actually may not occur, although rent renters may be extremely stressed after borrowing to stay in place. Um, so as rents get back to normal in our market, the underlying dynamic that rents rise faster than incomes of low-income families that will continue to drive displacement in our market. The right-hand quote illustrates the second reason that COPA is needed in that it, it's hard for buyers to know about opportunities to purchase commercial real estate, multifamily buildings of five units or more. This is actually a quote from this month's uh, wealthmanagement.com and how great it is to buy properties off market that estimates at least half of commercial real estate properties trade off market. And some folks say as much as 80% trade off market. And so that only one, one um, offer really had a chance at um, buying the property. Buildings like this often trade within one brokerage from one brokerage client to another without getting listed on one of the four or more listing services. Next slide. Thanks. So to develop a program proposal, council directed staff to engage with a cross section of community members and other stakeholders in designing a proposal uh, for a program. These included tenants and tenant advocates, landlords, property owners, brokers and realtors, housing developers, and lenders to housing. And so since April, we've been working with consultants that we hired to facilitate two types of teams. One's the smaller technical advisory committee that has a balanced um, composition of subject matter experts uh, from an array of different fields. And then a, a broader stakeholder advisory committee composed of people who have expressed interest in anti-displacement initiatives. And so they're members of the public, but we started with a list of over 200 people 250 who had previously expressed interest in anti-displacement. And so 
we've had um, over 160 people attending these meetings since April, um, over 200 people regularly getting updates and invitations, over I'm updating the data here, over 50 organizations represented. We counted 52 this morning. So this has been the first stage of our outreach work. And we're starting our second phase now where we're becoming more public. We first wanted to see if we could create a program proposal with the TAC that held together. And then we knew that we would do more outreach. So we're posting a web page this week with information about uh, the COPA proposal and inf background information with articles so people can come up to speed. And we know a lot of small and large property owners want to know more about the proposal. Um, we've had two very active members from Bonn on our technical advisory committee that came to both the TAC meetings and the SAC meetings. And we've had more small property owners and managers uh, at the stakeholder advisory committee meeting. So we'll talk some more about next steps as we reach out to the public very intentionally at the end of this presentation. Thanks. So what we wanted to do today is we knew we are not ready to give you a proposal for the program yet because we haven't done that second phase of outreach to the general public to get more feedback yet. What we wanted to do is lay the groundwork for your understanding about our market and the kinds of things that we were looking at as we thought about a proposal and tell you a little bit about what buildings look like and what they, what they sell for, things like that. So first, COPA would define a process for a qualified buyer to make a fair offer on a building that goes up for sale. And it would prescribe a timeline by which this would happen. So our first research question was, how long do properties take to close? And the second one is, where do renters live? So this chart lays out approximate prices and closing timelines that our policy team staff put together from three different sources of data. We also looked at data that was pre-COVID, and then we looked more at more recent data during COVID to make sure that we didn't base decisions on just an unusual time in the market. You can see that almost one third of San Jose renters, renter households live in either single family homes or condos and townhomes, which was more than I expected to see. Um, Looking at rented duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, they're about 13%, and then the remainder are in properties that are five or more units. And then you can also see, obviously, that the smallest properties, um, it takes a much shorter time to close than larger properties, the larger ones generally requiring structured financing, um, and whatever bidder goes up to and makes an offer on the property, they need to obtain bank financing and appraisals, and um, that that's very typical in the larger properties. Whereas we all know how fast single family homes are closing these days and that you know, buyers can be pre-qualified for this. So very different segments of the market. This is uh, another chart as we dig into this a little bit more deeply in the five plus units range. You can see there are differences by unit sizes and time to close. Notice that the average price per unit, it's slightly different actually than on the previous slide. And one of the things we learned through this work is that different data sources give different data. <laughs> you would think it would be easily accessible and consistent, and it turns out it's not. It actually to us indicates um, the fact that the multifamily market is somewhat fractured in that the data um, you know, on times for listing and times for sales, there's not one place to get all of that data. And for instance, the assessor's data does not indicate how long something took to sell. So when you try to cobble together different sources, it's actually not that simple to get a general read, but we believe that what we're representing here is kind of a, 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 an accurate cobbling together at different looks. So, um, and that's different than the one to four unit buildings. The multiple listing service is one place, all your one to four unit buildings are listed. It's quite transparent. And that's not the case for properties five units and up. 
uh, many developments are selling off listings. So that's the different data. So that is a little bit of background data. And generally, uh, COPA programs have certain elements that are common when you look across them. And when I say COPA programs, by the way, the A is for ACT. That's a common question. Uh, it's usually passed by legislation. Um, and then uh, also tenant uh, opportunity to purchase programs. Uh, while that's not what we're proposing here, they have similar um, categories, program elements as well. So during our process so far and our research, we've solicited and we heard feedback from our stakeholders about the variety of program elements. And here's an overview of the program elements that a program will include. So first applicability, what kinds of buildings would the program apply to? And usually it's cut by the number of units, uh, apartments in the, in the property. Exemptions, what kinds of buildings would the ordinance not apply to? So for instance, uh, transfers within a family and inheritances, usually not subject to a program like this. Uh, for example, owner occupied very small properties that serve as a primary residence for the owner who, sorry, uh, lives on one side and rents out the other. That is a common example of something that might be accepted under an ordinance. Accepted, exempted. Um, incentives. What would incent a property owner to do this program? So in terms of trying to make a program, um, how can we not just create a mandate, but also create some kind of financial incentive for folks to participate so their lives are somewhat neutral or even better? And so for instance, um, uh, there could be a transfer tax reduction or there could be other kinds of city fees or recording fees that are lessened, for instance. And timeline. Timeline's the one that a lot of people focus on. And there's a lot of detail of it. And so there are steps to the process, um, which are laid out a little bit more in the memo, but it's basically how long would a nonprofit buyer who is pre-qualified for the program, how long would they have to indicate the intention to make an offer? on a given property? And then how long would the, uh, the buyer or the, the nonprofit buyer have to actually make the offer? How long would the owner have to respond? So it, it lays out a timeline and um, just wanna be really clear, this is not a program forcing any owner to sell to any given buyer. And it's a common misconception where if you haven't sat through all the meetings and listened to all the details, I mean, people might be confused. That is not what we're doing. We're not forcing marriages. We're not di dictating sales prices at all. Um, we're just giving opportunities to make offers. Continuing on affordability, what, what's the target audience for the residents we're trying to help? Uh, qualifications of buyers. So the idea is to pre-qualify um, nonprofit developers of affordable housing who know how to do acquisition and rehab, and um, what would their qualifications need to be. Tenants' rights. So as I said, some programs focus a lot on tenants' rights to purchase, for instance, but we know in our market that today we don't have super strong tenant organizations that are there and ready to have tenant organizations form co-ops today and make offers. And so we're we're trying to think of other alternatives on ways that tenants can weigh in. So for instance, if a nonprofit buys a building up front, is there a way that tenants might be able to over time form a cooperative or form some kind of structure and make an offer by a given date, for instance, to purchase the building from the original purchasing nonprofit, something like that. And then enforcement. This is, of course, something that the city has to think through and to have the program, you know, be effective. And this plays with the amount of staffing uh, in the program. And, you know, we're, we're considering this that to be a very lightly staffed program if it does move forward. But 
really the question is, what's the city's role? How proactive would staff be able to be given their bandwidth? And therefore, does that involve third parties in helping to um, flag issues where, for instance, the procedures were not followed properly? So while COPA might be a new process to San Jose, it's not a new idea. And um, we're trying to design something that would promote adherence to the program, first and foremost. So next steps. In October, we're, we're moving from what we've been considering the first phase of design work to create a draft framework so that we can then get more public in the second phase to have something that the public can react to. So this phase two, with more public outreach, we're slating for November and December with drafts out there and public meetings that are widely advertised to get more feedback. And then if all goes according to plan, we would start with housing commission early next year, come back to the committee with a draft proposal and then to council in the first quarter. And of course, all of those are open and um, public comments invited. But in thinking through the many details that this program might entail, we're thinking about what is needed to understand now and what would the ordinance contain, and then what would end up being defined at a kind of a detailed level through regulations that, were, um, that would follow, kind of like the inclusionary housing ordinance. We pass the ordinance and then the details follow in the regulations later. And so in that time, if the city council were to pass the program, that next stage would be to develop very broad outreach um, plans to make sure that everyone in the market knows that this would be coming. And then outreach again on the detailed program rules so that there wouldn't be surprises. So this would be a detailed program uh, of course, because it involves real estate and different parties talking to each other and financing, but we don't we don't think it would be too much of an imposition, and we we're trying to design something that's very reasonable. Back to Jackie. Thanks, you, Kristen. Sorry, I was trying to find my unmute and photo. Um, I just want to. Um, acknowledge and thank the team that has been working on our uh, this project so far. While Kristen and I, and I know that Asen and Josh are here with us today to answer additional questions, we do want to recognize that it really takes a group of people to bring forward our pol these policy recommendations. And so with that, we are open for questions. Great, thank you for the presentation. I know we have several people here who would like to speak on this issue. So I will go to those callers right now, as soon as I can pull them up. Uh, again, we're talking about COPA. Uh, Tessa, Woodmansey. Okay, my one suggestion is that we stop using acronyms and we say exactly what it is. That's really important for community outreach as a democracy teacher that I am. So COPA, I looked it up, is some, it's, it's about buying property and I'm not sure all the details, but the thing that I'm looking at is that, you know, they're saying that, you know, pre-existing buildings, but we could also have property is that is really where, you know, land use is so critical and what we're using our land for. And so, when we're thinking about this, we can look at models of what happened at the Agra Hood in San Jose, where they bought that property and then they created a community garden for the senior housing and how vital that was to our community and, and the changes. And then Alry Middlebrook has been working on saving her property at 76 Ray Street to keep it agriculture and to, you know, and the programs that she's doing with this Center for Urban Sustainability. And she's worked with the county and the school districts to try to buy that property, but it's been a long process. So now she's going into possibly getting donations and, and, and funding it herself. But her whole idea has been an eco village. And that's where we need to go is eco villages. And, and so that's what happened over at the Agra Hood is to grow food locally there and to house the um, senior housing. And that's what her idea with uh, 76 Ray Street was to house, uh, create buildings to house students. 
And that's when she was working with the San Jose uh, School District, the San Jose College School District, Evergreen School District, to create housing for students and then to have that curriculum right in place. And that's the same idea that I'm having in terms of 615 Stockton Avenue is we buy that property and we build housing that in incorporates homelessness and um, how we can live sustainably on the education to, to live to learn to live sustainably. So these are the programs that we need to go forward. And of course, growing food would be a, a model on that land as well amongst the um, homeless and the sustainable. We are discussing the community opportunity to purchase program. This is about programs, uh, real estate that would be purchased already constructed. Moving on to uh, the caller with the initials JY. Please unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, I just heard about the Cobra. It sounds like uh, it will change the way that all rental property will be sold in San Jose and giving preferential treatment to special interest group and control over everything. Why isn't the community being notified about this? They told me SAC is the public meeting, but the real public was never notified about it. Small business and the rental property owners have been struggled during the pandemic. You should not make further attacks and place more regulations on business in San Jose. Corporate is government overreach with no justification with the taxpayers' money. I think your regulation is too much. The hand is too long to reach taxpayers' pocket. And I do agree, one speaker just mentioned, you need to reduce the regulation in the rental market instead of increased. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller is Cher L. Hi, yeah, this is Cheryl. I wanna say I've been on the stakeholder- Oh, Cheryl. <laughs> Hi, I wanna say I've been in the stakeholder meetings for a few months. And it's been difficult to participate because I've asked questions all the way back to June and haven't gotten answers. I've asked about San Francisco, how many units they've sold, no answer, no response. So it's hard to participate. And I've suggested other items, uh, topics, no response. Anyway, the final thing I would say on enforcement, we got 15 minutes to talk about enforcement. And the only thing I came away with, somebody says, oh, this will be complaint-based enforcement. The Law Foundation said, right, Kristen, allowing a private right of action takes some administrative burden off the city as well. So property owners will be turned into criminals if they advertise or sell their property without permission from the city. And it sounds like the enforcement of the housing department is already in place. Now, one thing I'd like to say is there was some mention just a minute ago that um, there's not gonna be any, um, there, when this thing first passed to, to get approved to take action, there was some mention from the housing department that mass evictions take place when a new property is, is, is bought. Now they're saying, well, the story's changing. Well, then, no, some of the tenants just move out and they're not really tracked or really, really don't know. So the story, that it just keeps changing all the time. So I wanna know where these mass evictions are happening. The other thing is they're talking about, oh, we're gonna, the tenants can maybe purchase these buildings later. Well, guess what? We've got 20,000 units of affordable housing right now. How many of those are you helping the, the, the people purchase right now? Um, the other thing is, this is just major government overreach into property rights. There's no justification. It's just the same thing the government does when they want to take land from the Native Americans, when there was gold on it, when they want to invade Iraq and say, oh, weapons of mass destruction. It's the same BS of taking people's property rights. So um, I think and th there needs to be major outreach to the entire city about this because this affects everybody in the entire city and the property rights and anybody who wants to purchase a small property to take care of their families later in life. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, Michael Trujillo. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Trujillo at the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. The Law Foundation strongly supports the implementation of a well-funded community opportunity to purchase act for San Jose. We want to thank the Housing Department for their efforts so far to reach all stakeholders and craft a COPA policy that will be effective in preventing residential displacement 
and preserving as many affordable homes as possible. By providing qualified nonprofit buyers a right of first offer and right of first refusal on residential properties when they go up for sale, a well-crafted COPA program would provide a unique opportunity to keep low-income tenants housed, permanently preserve affordable homes, and create new homeownership opportunities for families that have historically been excluded from San Jose's high-cost market. As pointed out in the staff report, the COVID-19 pandemic has primed San Jose's rental housing market for the acquisition of apartments with low-income residents, and these purchases are premised on the buyer's ability to evict the current tenants and convert the units to market rate rentals. Such market rate conversions will disproportionately displace San Jose's low-income tenants and unfairly impact the communities of color where these buildings are predominantly located. With the COPA program, the city will be able to leverage private and public resources to preserve um, some of these tenancies and buildings that would otherwise be lost to the market rate conversions. With this anti-displacement goal in mind, we urge the Housing Department, this committee and city council to build in a strong annual funding commitment for COPA acquisitions and technical assistance to empower tenants and create opportunities for them to acquire an ownership interest in that property after it's preserved and craft requirements for nonprofits that hold them accountable to keeping properties affordable in perpetuity. Thank you for this opportunity to comment on this important priority in the city's anti-displacement strategy we look forward to staying engaged as the housing department refines its specific provisions. Thank you. Next caller is Jenny Zhao. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, um, so my name is Jenny. I am a San Jose resident, also a rental property owner. So before I start to, to uh, the specific topic, I would like to remind that the previous agenda is about small business and I see all councils are so sympathetic and supporting to small business. So I would like to remind everyone that we are talking about rental property owner who are also small business and uh, we are paying our bills, we are continuing our services while we are lost our rental revenues during the pandemic. So we need help too, instead of, uh, you know, getting this another hit for this COPA program. And now specifically to COPA, I am also one of the task force members and I attend all the meetings. Uh, I have never been con convinced uh, by the data that there are any uh, massive displacement happening in San Jose because we have multiple layers of uh, tenant protections and there's no way for any uh, property owners to evict tenant uh, while change, property changing hands. So um, we have the rent registry, so why don't um, we have the data pulled from the rent registry to show that what kind of massive eviction that we're facing. And secondly, during the task force meeting, I don't think we ever talked about alternative measures instead of uh, implementing a very costly uh, law um, because uh, why the difficulty is the off-market sale. So why can't we just focusing on how to resolve that issue of the off-market sale of the properties instead uh, before we moving forward? Uh, thank you, that is my comment. Thank you. Next caller is Bonnie Liu. Please unmute yourself. Bonnie, you need to unmute yourself. There you go. Hi. Hi. I'm reading this letter for someone who does not use Zoom, so he couldn't attend this meeting. Here's the letter. I'm the owner of some mom and pop rentals in San Jose. I served on an advisory commission on rents in the Housing and the Community Development Commission for two terms through July 2019. I think as a result of the many hours of my service on the commissions, and participations in so many public forums that my name and the contact info is well known in our housing department. Nevertheless, I was completely, completely left out of the loop when the topic of COBA was introduced. 
I only learned about it recently by accident. There should be many more facts represented in these meetings, especially the small mom and pops. We are the ones who will be most impacted by the results of any of these proposals are enacted. My request today is that this process should be slowed down until a strong effort is made to seek broad inputs from owners most likely to be affected by this. There should be outreach and public forums throughout the city, not only on Zoom, but also other form of meetings that many mom, small mom and pops could attend. I do not accept the basic premise of COPA. I don't see why any group should be endowed with the right of both first refusal and to take up a for sale property to the exclusion of other offers. Thank you. Next caller is Steve Hanley. Welcome. Hi, Pam, how are you doing? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you for your indulgence in letting me speak here. Um, you know, I, I went on a vacation to Russia two or three years ago, and frankly, I feel like I'm in front of the Plit Bureau uh, uh, on some of this, this issue. Uh, I have a question that I'd like to have answered. Um, has anybody discussed the fact that this issue basically creates an option to purchase a property to a very specific group and that option is a real estate right that usually carries a financial um, consideration to the person who owns the property. And that right, in this particular case, goes to a nonprofit and is funded, I would imagine, by a local government and by taxes. That, to me, then brings up the subject of eminent domain being given to a specific group, which stands in, in kind of kind of in front of a, a document called the United States Constitution, which to me is kind of a, a slap in the face to the constitutionality of this kind of action. And I'm kind of wondering if that's even been considered by the, by the Commissar of Housing and the Housing Department. Um, it, it, it just runs counter, you know, counterintuitive to what this country is all about. So my question is, has that even been considered? Uh, who's gonna put up the option money to grant the nonprofits the right to have this? And how much, you know, where are the deep pockets to create, you know, the funding for that option? Thank you. Thank you. Next caller is Dan Pan. Hi, my name is Dan. Uh, on behalf, can you hear me? Yes. On behalf of BAHN Bond, representing mom and pop housing providers in the Bay Area, we urge the city of San Jose to stop the corporate discussing and focus the city's resource to on adding more housing supply and provide direct rent assistance to needed tenants. In the past two years, the mom and pop housing providers are the victims of the pandemic and the victims of the eviction momentum. We got a double hit. We have been struggling to survive. We are the ones who help, who need help for our government. How can we, our post policy uh, makers, continue to punish small business owners again and again with unjust law? When can you do something to help us to survive? Since the stay-at-home order, we have lost our ways to communicate with our elderly members who lack knowledge to using more modern tools that such as to Zoom or computer. Many of them don't even use email. A large percentage of San Jose mom and pop are elderly immigrants. We want to know what type of outreach effort the city staff did to them. They are indirect impact by the COPA, so can be kept in the dark about this important topic. 
we urge the city to put the COPA conversation on hold until the pandemic is over. The city must put real effort to engage the small housing providers as well as the entire San Jose community for their input. COPA is to take away an important piece of property rights and has impacted every San Jose homeowners. Proper engagement and outreach to the community are a must. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller is Sandra. First, thank you very much for allowing me to to speak and thank you to Kristen for acknowledging that more public outreach is definitely needed. I read the memo and several of the public letters. While there's a claim of some significant community outreach and diversity, the memo does not list the organizations or the community members that participated. I attended one or two SAC meetings by accident, meaning there was no contact or outreach by the city. I just accidentally arrived thinking another topic was being discussed. The attendees were mainly nonprofits which have a financial interest in COPA and renters. So my questions are, one, were holders of city business licenses for rental property contacted? Two, how many and what percentage of the mom and pop housing providers, which appear to be the housing providers group most impacted participated? Three, what businesses and rental property owners and organizations participated? What was the actual outreach conducted? Because it was not adequate. There are, there are and continue to be basic assumptions and claims made as to the benefit of COPA, but with no act, actual evidence. One, there is no long-term benefit provided in the memo on the benefit of COPA. Two, there is no evidence that the impact of mom and pop property and financial rights are addressed. Three, there's a basic assumption that nonprofits cannot compete in the marketplace and that they deserve special treatment. In conclusion, I personally do not think that the city should consider COPA until there's at least five years of experience in markets similar to San Jose. And I do not think that adequate outreach to the housing provider community was provided and suggesting that you're going to do it now during the holiday season indicates you really don't want their participation. This needs to be more seriously looked at. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next caller is Tim Bobian. Thank you, Tim Bobian, representing the Santa Clara County Association of Realtors and our 6,000 plus members. We have some major concerns regarding this COPA ordinance, mainly surrounding scope, timelines, education, applicability, enforcement, and effectiveness. Uh, the scope of the units is, is largely broad and, and will result in ineffectiveness. The timeline is going to be unrealistic and cumbersome. Education and applicability of a program this large is going to be infeasible. Therefore, enforcement will be difficult and disproportionately impact our smaller brokerages and housing providers who are not properly educated on the requirements. We also feel this program will be largely ineffective at its intended goal, which SCORE does support preventing displacement and promoting home ownership. This program will effectively do neither. City staff and resources will be much better served in other efforts to truly work to, to prevent displacement and help increase home ownership in underserved communities. While we have been engaged as members of the TAC and SAC, we feel largely unheard and urge much more comprehensive outreach to the public to have a complete understanding of how this policy would impact the community and the real estate industry. SCORE stresses our concern of this proposal and the unintended consequences of COPA. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Oscar Castro. Good afternoon, committee members. Uh, my name is Oscar Castro, Working Partnerships, um, standing alongside with community partners here in support of the Community, community Opportunity to Purchase Act, also known as COPA, which is a key strategy in addressing displacement in San Jose. I would like to take a moment to thank staff for all their hard work throughout this process. Uh, as the presentation uh, showed, there was a lot of work um, in both getting us to this point and coordinating with all these different stakeholders. So we really appreciate everything that has been done on that front. Uh, COPA has been identified as a key piece of the city's anti-displacement plan as low-income residents throughout the city become at risk of displacement due to increased cost of living and lack of affordable housing opportunities. Building out San Jose's preservation toolkit so we can keep our homes affordable is paramount so that families 
who have built their lives in the city can continue to do so. We look forward to further dialogue on this important matter. In particular, we look forward to uplifting the voice of tenants throughout this process through engagement and participation through COPA so that those who have been significantly impacted by this housing crisis are given the opportunity to be part of housing solutions such as this. Um, thank you very much for your opportunity to provide comment. Thank you. Next caller is Liz Gonzalez. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Liz Gonzalez with Silicon Valley Debug and the South Bay Community Land Trust. We signed on to a letter in support of COPA with several community organizations that I don't really see in the letters from the public, but I hope you all received for your review. Um, it's important not to have misinformation and myths drive this work into something ineffective. A tenant-centered COPA is one critical tool to not only give agency to tenants over our own housing, but a way to stabilize families long-term, expand home ownership opportunities for families who have been most excluded. And as this process continues, we urge you to support tenant decision-making and have the city identify a dedicated source of revenue to fund COPA and a larger preservation strategy. In the city's goals around anti-displacement and equity, implementing and funding a tenant-centered COPA demonstrates to our community that these are true priorities in action. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller is Emily Ramos. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Good afternoon, council members. This is Emily Ann Ramos with Silicon Valley at Home. To clarify some confusion about this policy, we would like to point out a few things. This program does not require any property owners to sell unless they want to. Nothing requires landlords to sell below market. And if they don't accept the initial offer, they can go directly to the market and the community nonprofit will either match any other offer or does the community nonprofit will simply not participate. Note that all of the nonprofit offers in San Francisco has closed as far as we can tell. Now the clear intent is that the property owners receive full value for their properties should they decide to leave the market. Um, we know that now is the time that major outside investors are looking to gobble up rental properties and we don't need the, the speculative out-of-state landlords newly dominating the market for our small apartments. So we're looking at this program as a win-win for everyone, that tenants uh, are, get to be housed, we preserve this naturally affordable housing, and we quite possibly even grow our affordable housing uh, portfolio in the city. Um, so um, just to clarify um, some of the points that have gone back uh, that has been spoken of and also been um, emailed to the council members that this program does not require property owners to sell their property unless they want to. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for this item. Thanks for the previous clarification by a housing department person about uh, the flea market issues and, and that the rent issues are for their for their own living situations and not for the uh, rental space at the flea market. Um, about this issue, you know, uh, it, it was nice to hear different points of view. I mean, I, I come from the point of view that I feel the COPA ideas are to help consider uh, that are a part of along the lines of uh, rent control issues and land trust issues, and to give a certain hedge uh, to create an understanding of, of, of how to create, uh, uh, you know, uh, prices for 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 land and 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 what we can expect from like say nonprofits uh, purchasing these places who have good practices usually in human rights and tenants rights. And, and they're people that we can trust in, in how to work uh, these sort of issues in San Jose. Uh, it's that combination that we can be considering, uh, you know, a kind of a, 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 a more humanistic system and way to work. Um, and this is a bit uncomfortable to, to free market capitalism. But at the same time, you know, these, these places being purchased can um, eventually be 
uh, co-opted into co-ops and and uh, and worked on by by the tenants themselves, basically. As my understanding is, is the way these sort of things can develop, like with the land trust issues. So I, I think there's really interesting possibilities in what COPA can work for. As always, I hope that recent COPA things will be wanting to consider mixed income ideas that I think are flexible and they invite all parts of the economic income levels to be a part of, a, of an area and a part of a building. That's an interesting concept that invites everyone to, to question and consider. Thank you. Next caller is Andrea Portillo. Hi, can y'all hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, good afternoon, uh, members of the committee. My name is Andrea Portillo with Somos Mayfair, and I'm here to, along with other community partners and community to voice our support uh, for the COPA program so that we can both preserve our affordable housing supply while also creating a space for community ownership in their, uh, of their own housing. Um, our San Jose families are in a crisis. You know, we, we continue to hear from community that they are getting pushed out um, and we are getting pushed out of our communities due to increased cost of living, current threats of eviction, displacement, and just general lack of access to affordable housing options that lead to long-term home ownership. Um, I, one of the previous speakers mentioned waiting five years until we get a better sense of what this policy would look like. Our communities don't have five years. Um, our communities can no longer wait. And the time is now for us to find bold solutions to address the issues of displacement taking place throughout the city. Preserving homes that are afford affordable and accessible to all should be a priority. And that is the intent for this COPA program, to prevent displacement of low-income communities of color and marginalized tenants, to stabilize housing and maintain affordability so that folks can maintain their community ties and not have to be pushed out of their neighborhoods and also to give tenants voice and choice regarding their housing by creating and finding ways to include pathways to ownership for our very low and extremely low income folks. Um, let's protect rental housing from the speculative market by also involving and making sure that tenant involvement throughout this process is a key part of this program. Um, our hope is that COPA ensures that the tenant voice continues to get lifted so that those who have been most impacted by this crisis have the opportunity to engage in solutions. I want to thank the city's housing staff um, for taking and putting so much time and work into this program, and we look forward to continuing to work together. Thank you. Caller 5140. Yeah, this is uh, this is kind of non-profit, not-for-profit stuff. I don't buy it. It's a money laundering scheme, just like a uh, foundation is, like the foundation to buy toys for the kids and all that. No, this is this is just a, a shell game to avoid taxes. It, it lets uh, political donors look like good people. Giving they give to these foundations or these not-for-profits versus a campaign contribution. I mean, this exact kind of scam that it sounds like reminds me of a Sopranos episode of just manipulation with nonprofits and HUD and all these do-gooder politicians. And who's going to get the place? That's what I want to know. Who are the people who get these, these businesses, loans, or these houses? Who are they related to? Or they just pick randomly from a, a group of, uh, of people who have put down for this? Or is it, is, it a, is it a kickback deal to a friend of a friend or a family member or a godchild? You know you guys do it. I mean, come on. Come on. That's what it's all about, right? I mean, the, the city council, you know, you guys should just have a trough in that place because that's what it's all about. I'd like to hear any of you say in writing, or even on this call, that this doesn't go to anybody that you people know personally or professionally or or blood-related or, or, or friends from way back when. Who gets all these goodies? That's what I like to know. And you guys never have response for it, ever. I mean, ever. You guys would never put it in writing because you know. You know that your friends are getting 
and, and family members are getting these things. Anyway, let's go, Brand Next caller is Kevin Ma. Afternoon, council members. My name is Kevin Ma with the South Bay Community Land Trust. Just to clarify, COPA is a situ in a situation where the quote unquote mom and pop landlord is leaving the business. It's not in the day to day of how the rental market works. So people literally like, I want to sell my property at the highest price so I can do kick off that problem to other people and leave the tenants on their own. Inherently, um, this, the entire basis of this proposal is basically public outreach on that sale property. Qualified nonprofits don't know what's going on until basically after the purchase is over, which is already too late for this. So for all the talks about insufficient community outreach for COPA itself, there's already insufficient community outreach for the actual sale property, which is where the people actually currently live in. As we've seen with previous instances like mobile home parks, where we have had generally a lot of community interest about maintaining those properties because the people there would be basically entirely priced out of the city because you know they're on fixed income. This entire COPA is a much more generalization for that for the entire apartment buildings in the entire city, in that inherently a lot more people live in them than the mobile home parks. Um, for all the talks about tenant protections, obviously we have made improvements, but inherently a lot of those improvements are still requires legal aid. And we all know legal aid is underfunded at this point, whereas property rights of homeowners and property owners are still very strong involving, you know, rights about foreclosures, about disclosures about sales and all of that. And fundamentally, this is a preservation policy. The people in the buildings already live here and we're threatening their ability to live here if the outsider comes in and just raises the rent to whatever it is to market rent. And that if we want to address our homelessness issues, if we want to address the overcrowding issues, if we want to address the exodus of people to the Central Valley, we need to make steps like this faster rather than doing constant community opposition about dialogue and outreach. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller is Brenda Doman. Hi, um, I want to thank the committee for allowing me to speak. I also wanted to um, first off say that I completely agree with Cheryl's comments and Steve Hanley's comments. Um, I believe that COPA is targeting small housing providers. And um, I think that the, this program is actually trying to give property rights to tenants, which seems illegal to me. Um, you know, property rights have to do with owning the property and the deed and doing what you want with the property. Um, I think it's a biased policy uh, created from a playbook outside of San Jose and that it's very political and based on personal narratives in the housing department. The outreach has been lacking. Meetings have been confusing, especially um, by so many different San Jose departments, committees, commissions. The process has been very hard to follow. I also disagree with the public outreach between now and the end of the year. Uh, to get this finalized. I think that you should do the public outreach and the public comments um, after the first of the year. I think you're rushing it and it's during the holidays and people won't have adequate time to attend these types of meetings. And it's an important issue. Um, lastly, I think it's a punitive, cumbersome, uh, complex uh, process for small home providers. Um, it doesn't usually involve a lot of units. I think on your slide, it was like, 55 units plus, I mean, you should be looking at buildings that have like 500 units or 1,000 units so that you can get more bang for your buck and get more tenants under that umbrella of, you know, controlling rents or whatever it is you want to do with this anti-displacement policy. Um, I think it, um, I think it should. Thank you. Next caller is David Eisbach. Thank you very much. I, uh, I've been listening here quite attentively and uh, I had actually met with uh, members of the, uh, of the COPA committee and I had made certain observations. First off, it's timing. The, if you have a property that you must in fact 
receive an offer before, and then once you've actually received an offer that is acceptable to you, then that first party, the COPA connection, would come and purchase it. Now, let's look at you are a buyer and you're looking at two properties. They could be fourplexes, it could be anything. You're looking at two properties that are very close together. In that, you note that one is has a right of refusal, re first refusal. In other words, they can pick it up. If you allow that, then, and the other one doesn't have that, then which one are you going to buy? The one that is unencumbered. The other thing is, how can a, uh, an outfit that is a nonprofit get the money to buy a property, reduce the, the income on it, and keep up the maintenance on it? How are they able to do that? It must rely on city government and state and everyone else supporting that. Now, it isn't just that particular uh, nonprofit, but the profits, uh, nonprofits in education and job training and so on. Make a, a study of the costs of both. Thank you. Next caller is Tobin Gilman. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I just want to echo some of the concerns that have already been expressed about um, COPA. Look, I think programs that uh, facilitate transparency in the market are worthy of looking at. I think a program that um, might consider some incentives for sellers may be worthy of consideration, but something that um, puts directives and mandates over the timing of sales or the offer selection criteria, absolutely not. It also concerns me that COPA seems to give qualified nonprofits an unwarranted advantage over other buyers. You know, these organizations don't necessarily have the residents' best interest at heart, believe it or not. They should be treated with the same scrutiny um, that other special interest groups have, including real estate associations, property developers, and institutional um, investors. Um, I also, just on the, uh, the outreach aspect of this, I'm involved with a neighborhood association where I live. and I've also over the past year been working with a lot of neighborhood associations across the city. And I'll tell you what, we've never heard anything about this. You know, to be quite frank, I don't think we've heard anything about any programs from the housing department. So there's that. And then finally on the timing, you know, somebody mentioned, a couple of people have mentioned the holiday season. That's not the only thing that's coming up. Um, in the month of November and December, the city is going to be looking at redistricting, uh, residential zoning, specifically opportunity housing and Senate Bills 9 and 10, and a whole bunch of recommendations from the City Charter Review Commission. So it's a really bad time to be looking at this. It, it is definitely something that could wait until next year. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller is Raymond Lee. Raymond, please unmute yourself. Hello? Thank you, yes, we can hear you. Yes, and uh, uh, I have been a renter for seven years and a landlord for 12 years in San Jose. First, I just heard about COPA and my friend, no matter as tenants or landlords, have never heard about that before. And when I Google San Jose COPA on the internet this morning, I got zero result, zero. In internet era, I think our San Jose housing department need a wider outreach. And second, COPA is a violation of our constitution about property rights. Uh, and uh, because it's uh, simply treating privately owned, operated and developed housing as if it was a public utility. When well, everything appreciated like crazy nowadays, including grocery in Walmart and Costco, or PG&E water insurance, etc., how can you just simply restrict and manipulate the free market decided 
housing price. How can the seller survive? In so doing, it harms not only housing providers, but also in the long run, the free housing market and tenant we intend to serve. I strongly oppose COP, and we need to discuss it more in a wider public. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller is Maxine Luba, uh, Lubau. Lubau. Sorry, I'm mispronouncing your name. I think I'm unmuted now. Yes. Okay. Um, there's a bunch of things here. First of all, they talk about how I'm doing the outreach. I've been a landlord for over 40 years, and I haven't heard a thing about this. So I don't know who they've been going out reaching to. But there are a bunch of things that are uh, very important. Uh, one of them is the uh, thing that they're talking about, all these people who are going to come in, buy the property, raise the rents. You can't do that. We have rent control. They can't raise the rents anymore. Then I can raise the rents. And even the small amounts which were allowed in San Jose, even then you can't do now because of the COVID thing. So that's not a big deal. And the last thing, really important thing I want to get is they say they uh, just want to match offers. And that would be fine if the um, people went ahead and matched the offer that was received on the open market. But you've put an exception in They say they don't have to match time. But that is of the essence. All of the federal laws are very specific on how much time you have before you must identify the property, how much time you must have before you complete this sale. So, and you're going to end uh, the identification time for new properties if you're exchanging. Um, so, it's extremely important that if the nonprofit is going to match the offer, they're going to match the time as well. Absolutely of the essence. Um, and the last thing I would like to talk about is somebody came up with a magic number saying that 80% of the properties never went on the market. It was private sale. I've been in the business for a long, long time. Everyone who's trying to sell a property wants to get the maximum coverage they can. They get it distributed as much as they possibly can. So everybody has an offer to make the chance to make an offer. Thank you. Next caller is Anil Babar. Thank you, uh, Council, for letting me speak today. Anil Babar with the California Apartment Association. I uh, wanted to express our concerns as well on the COVID policy. Um, generally, we still questioning the necessity of a policy that adds additional time to the transaction to allow nonprofits to make an offer when, in fact, if you look at um, the, the kind of average days on market, both from the city's presentation and what is actually in on published in the MLS, uh, there's plenty of time to make an offer. There, you know, the properties are on the market for 50, 60, 70 days. In that time, I don't understand why uh, they need this, uh, any special advantage to make an offer when there's plenty of time already available. Secondly, listings. There's plenty of listings. There's 60 properties on the market right now. Have they made any bids? Have any nonprofits made bids on those existing properties? I, I question that. The delay in the, they're, that they're adding to the transaction in somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 days. How are you supposed to be able to determine true market value of your property when you can't go out to the market and, and determine what the what the market will bear? Um, and, and that kind of uh, hits at the whole notion that it's been repeated on and on today that um, you know, you're know you free to sell your property to whoever you want. You can't, you won't know if that offer from that nonprofit is accurate unless you've gone to the open market to make that bid. Uh, all in all, this this pro this policy needs a lot more work and a lot more uh, consideration before it, it's ready for prime time. And I uh, echo many of the comments today that you know we need to have a lot more outreach. We need to hear from a lot more owners, um, and we need you know more proactive outreach. And um, you know as far as, as far as the California Apartment Association is concerned, we are going to be reaching out to our members to let to ask them their about their input, and we encourage the city to do more of that kind of outreach. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller is Jackie. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. 
Hi, this is Jackie Rivera with the South Bay Community Land Trust, the first CLT in the South Bay formed to combat displacement and create collectively owned permanently affordable housing. We are here along with other community partners, as you have heard, in support of the creation of an effectively funded Community Opportunity to Purchase Act that centers tenant decision making and capacity building and expands different homeownership opportunities and overall commits to the preservation and creation of permanently affordable housing. Um, COPA or Community Opportunity to Purchase Acts gives tenants and qualified nonprofits a chance in the fast moving Bay Area real estate market where it is nearly impossible to compete with open market buyers who are offering either all cash or more simple financing terms and shorter closing timelines, of course. COPA levels that playing field with purchasing timelines and funding that makes it possible for tenants and qualified nonprofits to organize, negotiate a contract, secure financing, and close the deal to stabilize their communities. A COPA policy is necessary so that low-income residents in San Jose who are at risk of displacement and predominantly people of color have ample opportunities to stay in their communities and have a voice in how their property is acquired and operated. Um, thank you again for you know, working on, on this and you know, again, really emphasizing tenant centering and the policy for those most impacted. And I also just wanna say for those, you know, you're gonna have a lot of folks bring up property rights and all these things. Um, but point them towards the fact that in DC, they have a tenant opportunity to purchase act that was enacted more than 30 years ago in the capital of this country. And that has not been uh, contested or successfully contested. So um, yeah, I just want to throw in there also those things because you're gonna hear that a lot. Um, thanks again for uh, looking towards board solu bold solutions and yeah, potentially implementing this policy. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller is SVV Leeds. And we have two more callers after that. I'd like to finish the caller uh, public comment with Joyce, and then we'll go to my colleagues for input. Hi, good afternoon, uh, council members. Uh, my name is Kelsey Baines. I am with uh, YIMBY Action. Uh, that stands for Yes in My Backyard. We advocate for welcoming communities where everyone can thrive. Um, and I want to encourage you to move forward with COPA um, in order to prevent community displacement, um, as well as the loss of uh, lower cost rental homes in the community. Um, I also think empowering tenants and community groups with ownership um, is a good thing. Um, this isn't zero sum. Um, and I really think that preventing displacement helps everyone. Uh, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, um, and I've really seen the consequences of displacement in our county um, by working with folks who are both entering homelessness, trying to leave homelessness, and just feeling like it's this tidal wave uh, that we can't stop. So really preventing homelessness in the first place requires pre uh, preventing displacement. Um, I've personally been displaced because my landlord sold the rental where I lived. Um, the investors who purchased the property demolished uh, multifamily housing to build a mansion. Um, in addition to this being bad for me as a tenant and my fellow tenants, I also think it's just bad for the community as a whole. Um, preventing displacement really prevents or promotes uh, community health and well-being. Um, it helps people feel a sense of belonging and inclusion um, in their community. Um, it also um, helps reduce health disparities, um, so financial disparities, but also educational disparities, um, physical health disparities. Um, and as a, the previous speaker noted, um, TOPA has already been successfully implemented for decades in other places. Um, and it is it can be a really cost effective way to preserve homes. Uh, it's certainly cheaper than building new homes, which I'm very enthusiastic about, but I think we need to bring lots of solutions to the table. Thank you, Mina Young. Mina, please unmute yourself. Hi, this is Mina Young. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. We can. I, I'm a small property owner and I have been contemplating on uh, converting my single family house to multiple units. But over and over again, the, over the last especially 10 years, uh, restrictions have been preventing me from considering that. And this COPA will be another big uh, no-no for my plan. 
And as I know, uh, Washington DC has a similar plan and I don't think the housing pricing is that good. You know, tenants are still having problem uh, finding affordable housing. So it's not working over there that I know. And um, uh, nationalizing a private property to, uh, to uh, from private property into government housing had not worked before. The Section 8 program had converted the vouchers to uh, make use of the private properties because government ho housing is not working. So please say no, uh, Copay will not work. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller is Joyce. And final caller is Alex. You got in under the gun, Alex. Hello. Good afternoon. This is Joyce. Can you hear me? Yes, we oh, can. Hi. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you for uh, ha uh, having me have a chance to, to sk speak up my mind. And I am a small business provider, landlord, in San Jose for many years. And I just want to see, I can see city council and the government, they may have a very good intention in help the community, which I appreciate, but I do not see uh, the, uh, how do you make the work in this program? See, number one, I echo the comments I heard before, like Cheryl or Jenny. So many points are already spoken. So to me, the legality of this uh, ordinance or program and also the outreaching in depth and also the timing, those things, and, and also the study in depth as well. I don't think you are done that yet. So the, 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 I want to focus on the how practical you can enforce this as a government agency. How have, have you done any study or in depth to really figure out how can you make this program work? You have a good intention. Maybe you end up like you spend taxpayers' money, and you have to. You know, it doesn't work. I saw many bad examples around. So, and uh, I want to speak for the uh, small business landlord. They may not have. In they strive busy on everyday life too, but they may not have uh, easy access to internet. So that's why they are not informed. And just for the uh, during the pandemic, you know. For the landlord, uh, financial assistance, so many papers, they don't know what to do, and lots of people, they give up on that. I want you to take consideration of this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Final caller is Alex Shore. Thanks, Councilmember Foley. I, I guess I got under the starting gun, so I will make this a sprint. I know we're still working through some of the policy particulars of this issue and perhaps doing some more public engagement. In the meantime, I just wanna say thank you to those who have been working so hard on this policy. I think uh, concept-wise, it is absolutely the right direction. Uh, anything we can do to give the community more opportunity to find affordable housing and have more control over their economic destiny and more independence is a good thing for our city. Thank you so much, council member, for your time and for all the folks who came out and talked about this issue today. Great, thank you. Thank you for all of the people who came and spoke on the issues, on both sides of the issues. We are just uh, listening to the presentation today. We're not voting on anything. It'll go out for more public comment and then to the HCDC committee uh, housing Community Develop Committee uh, in next year, and then it will come back to us, and then eventually it will go to City Council. So there is more work that can be done and questions that can be answered. So I will turn to my colleagues and start with Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, and I was actually going to just echo some of your sentiment right now or your statements. Um, I think we we heard concern in regards to um, people feeling as though they'd like to see more outreach and engagement. And just to be clear, as the chair just stated, uh, this is still uh, early in the process and there's gonna be a lot of opportunities, not only to engage in, in committee meetings, but I wanted to see if staff could, um, could highlight again um, the outreach. There was a next step slide that you put up. Um, I don't know if you can 
bring that back up again. She's got slides control. And while she's pulling that up, actually attachment A to the memo is a more complete review of what the timeline looks like and the work plan. And it goes beyond the council um, consideration of the program to the additional outreach that we would do also while we were waiting for the program to take effect because everyone in the design process has agreed how important it is that everyone in our market become aware of what the rules are. And um, everyone is in agreement on that and that it's gonna be a heavy lift. I mean, there's no, uh, there's no sugarcoating that. We have a, a million person city and a lot of small property owners and a lot of residents. So um, I think success of the program depends on people becoming aware of what it means and what it doesn't mean and getting a little more comfortable um, with how it's gonna work and hopefully not too hard, not too much stress. And, and appreciate Sorry, that. What slide did you wanna see, council member? The next um, steps, was it? Yeah, next step slide. Yeah, that one there. And uh, Kristen was just making mention of the attachment um, uh, that is is a, is actually uh, attachment A that is uh, accessible uh, to the public, but I know that's not what this the this is just a PowerPoint slide that's going along with it. But uh, if you don't mind, Kristen, just talk a little bit about some of those opportunities that that are described here in attachment A in the upcoming months, where we will actually. Uh, allow not and not just the committee meetings, but just obviously allowing um, input from uh, from our community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you for that. So our thought was, as we're putting together the proposal, that we would be having continued stakeholder meetings because this topic goes several layers deep. Really, it's about a system that we're trying to create. Um, including financing, including outreach, including capacity building for nonprofits. So people have spoken to all those things tonight or today. Um, so uh, after, during our public um, outreach period, so I'm on the third line there, we're at draft program description for public review. The public review period, our thought is and I know this is a tough time of year. And so I totally appreciate uh, comments on that. We are all struggling with a lot of work to get done. Um, so, but the public review period, we would be holding, we would be doing widely advertised, um, publicly accessible sessions on Zoom. I also heard the request for in-person meetings and um, so it would be where we would start to introduce the concepts of the overall framework and proposal, and then more details enough to, for people to get comfortable um, with that next level and kind of go through things together. So we anticipate several public meetings in a relatively short time. So frankly, that's why we listed the flexibility on the dates because we wanna make sure that we feel comfortable that we've done enough before we start to bring it forward um, for public meetings and that you know that we're getting a kind of a consensus. We don't know, not everyone's gonna get comfortable with this. Um, and it won't be everyone's favorite program, but we think if we'll end up somewhere in the middle and everyone kind of is you know okay with it, in the end, they'll live with it, then we've kind of done our job. So those were to go through um, the end of this year and um, more in January. And then we will be deciding about return to the committee based on attendance and what we're hearing. But you know, this is far from the end of the outreach because it would go continually after the council consideration. So that's the challenge, which is we're gonna need feedback on details. So we wanna get people comfortable enough with the framework and the promise to engage with us on more details, um, but not let that stop us from moving forward into that phase of, okay, we know we have a go, it's worth working on all the details together. Okay, yeah, no, I thank you, I appreciate that. And I just, um, you know, from, from experience here, especially with um, 
really broad uh, policies like this uh, and, and impactful, as we know, um, and, and contentious, um, it's important to have the outreach and the education. And uh, in, in my experience, and this is very typical where earlier on, um, especially on first draft uh, language, we will uh, hear a lot of that feedback. And I know that obviously the plan is there and the attachment is there. So I encourage um, anybody that participated today or is watching and is concerned about uh, maybe not feeling engaged or invited to, to take a look at that attachment and, um, and then continue to be part of the process as we're, we're working through it. And um, I would say uh, to, to your comment, Kristen, about uh, looking for some sort of consensus here. Um, I think my colleagues that have been on the, the council with us recognize that uh, we end up at times disagreeing our, ourselves and, and certainly in disagreement with community on different policies that we move forward on. Uh, so we just try to, to consciously craft the uh, the best policies possible, um, recognizing the impacts and uh, and then the the, the benefits, and um, you know, and we know we recognize that that doesn't uh, always lead to to full consensus. Um, and in regards to some of the timelines, so I, I think this is something just to clarify that it's still um, not known as far as uh, the time period that we would give. A qualified nonprofit to to make their decision or to close on uh, or make an offer and then close it, it, those time periods. I know you you put in there the analysis of you know the average days to close for single family cells or condos and uh, fourplexes stuff like that. We we haven't come up with recommendations yet on that time frame or uh, and, and what does that look like? Yeah, we're kind of circling the wagons and we're thinking about a bifurcated timeline. For small buildings, it would be a quicker timeline so that it would be much more in keeping with what the market looks like now. And then um, for larger properties, a different timeline. So our um, technical advisory committee and our stakeholder advisory committee attendees in the last couple of weeks saw those kinds of draft proposals and we invited more comment and written comments and comments live, Q and A's and, um, and they're not shy. And so <laughs> they're giving, you know, lots of feedback offline as well. So um, anyway, I, I don't know if we wanted to say any more about that, but um, Josh or Ethan. Yeah, you know, this no, that, that's, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure I was understanding that correctly because I didn't see any specificity. Right. And I, I assume that's something right. obviously that we're, we're, we're still baking and uh, that will be determined. And I yeah. think that is good. And I think we're hearing feedback on that. And what we want to try to do in my mind would be to strike a balance of uh, giving enough time for um, a qualified nonprofit to uh, decide if they wanted to make an offer, make an offer, but not delaying the process too much, right? That would then allow the seller to uh, to respond to that, whether they accept it or, or obviously the, the delay would be if they did not accept that offer. And then have to go out to uh, a more competitive, um, you know, market process. And so, I know it's a balance we want to try to strike. I appreciate the uh, data that you've gathered to try and understand uh, what are those average times um, that that is actually taking, um, you know, these properties to to close. And it all makes sense there. And so I I know that's what we'll be utilizing to make our decision. Um, and 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 I you know didn't state this up front, but uh, I am um, and have been generally support of uh, the COPA program uh, or Community Opportunity to Purchase uh, Act um, and am familiar through now our process here with um, the program in San Francisco and then Washington, D.C. I know that came up a couple of times. Is, is there a concern that we have on legality? Um, I, I know I, I don't have that concern, but I wanted to, to, to see just sort of in the conversations and clearly we've seen this done. Um, is there any concern the staff has had um, through the process on legality? Yeah, and I can't, I'm not my attorney, Chris Alexander, who is um, off today for a well-deserved vacation day, but um, we've been consulting because, you know, we've gotten feedback, of course, from our, uh, uh, from our group members saying that they thought that there could be um, legal concerns with it. And so far, we are, he is pretty comfortable moving forward. Um, 
We know that in San Francisco, what the proposed claim was going to be, they were threatened with lawsuit when they were devising the program. And um, we understand what that proposed claim would be, and that has never surfaced. Um, we also understand, you know, the question about is this a takings or not? And um, we kind of analyze, he analyzed that. We talked about that. We do not believe that takings is a sound legal basis for any claim. And so, um, again, that's one of the main design elements is that we want to design this so that it is not a major delay um, that we're asking folks to wait to receive an offer because we understand that that's a change and that's a that's something that folks um, you know aren't used to doing and so you know that is that's one of our key design elements so that it does not become a problem. Yeah, thank you. And look, I'm not an attorney either, obviously. Um, yeah. And uh, on, on the council, uh, even though we have some attorneys, I don't think anybody's going to be able to, to, to claim being a professional in this, this or an expert in this area. And so we rely on obviously our, our city attorney's office to give us that analysis, because um, I've heard those concerns as well. And um, right. I, I, I know they exist uh, in a couple other municipalities and, and certainly I'm comfortable with the analysis that our city attorney's office does, and I imagine we'll continue to, to look at that as, as concerns arise. I would agree right. that the, the timeline, the, the length of time for the qualified nonprofit to, to make the offer is indeed the, I think the, you know, the biggest concern there. Um, and I know that's why we're trying to be conscious about that. I, I would hope that as we strike a balance and I look, I, I would I also hope that our, that any, um, anybody that, that is, that is currently not in support of the program would participate to advocate and try to make the program better, even if it's not something that they would support. And this would be the area I think that would be most crucial would be to understand um, that timeline. So then that way, uh, you know, it, it, it does not uh, really negatively impact a, a sale. And, and I appreciate that, um, you know, the, the, the timeline is the most sensitive because otherwise, if, if a seller doesn't want to accept an offer from a qualified nonprofit, they don't have to. Uh, they can simply say no. So it's really that that time of delay that they may believe that they've been caused uh, that's, that's, I think, of most concern. And, and I would also hope that sellers recognize the environment that we're in and, um, and, and that this program is intended to try and keep um, properties affordable, to try and keep opportunities there for um, individuals, not necessarily uh, take an opportunity of, uh, you know, um, earning a profit on a sale. And, um, and I, I too personally know we had one uh, a speaker uh, mention uh, their displacement. I was displaced with my uh, my wife and, and our six month old uh, in a in a place that uh, we had been living for nine years and um, same thing it was good just going up for sale and um, a, a single family home and they they you know the the owners there were great and had been great to us we had a good relationship but for them it was it was time to move out of the area sell and 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 they were looking for the most profit possible and I would believe that you know for them. Um, they would have been comfortable with a very small delay in allowing an opportunity for tenants like my my wife and I to potentially have an opportunity to see is this something that you know that we could utilize a program like this to be able to to maintain um, living in in the home um, and and as was pointed out in regards to the number of single family homes where we're talking about the percentage of our our rental stock being the second highest with that 32%. I mean, that's what we fell into. And, and I, I don't think many people recognize that, right? And many people probably are thinking, well, these are homes that are being lived in. They're actually being utilized, right? As, as, as rental properties. And those are the ones um, that turn over, as we know, in our city very often because the, the, the um, you know, dollar amount for single family homes has continued to rise. And, uh, and as we see people um, leaving the area, uh, a lot of the, that rental opportunity goes off of the market and um, does not become available. I think the impact there is a little less than obviously when you're looking at the five plus units, which is the majority of our rental stock. Uh, and there you're talking about turning over or displacing a lot more people. So I think there's more value there um, in what we'll see in potentially some, some COPA opportunities. Uh, but I just personally have experienced that displacement and turnover from a single family home, uh, being a single family home tenant, 
And uh, programs like this, I, I again, I would hope that our our sellers um, of, of property here would actually understand the value of this program and would be comfortable with a uh, a process, a, a small timeline that would allow uh, COPA or the Community Opportunity to Purchase uh, would allow that program um, to to potentially help with this crisis that we're in of, of lack of affordable housing. And so uh, I'll. I'll uh, I don't have any other questions at the moment, and I'll I'll leave my comments there. I know we're just accepting. I think the status update, so I'll make um, a motion to accept the, the the update. Second. Okay, great, Kristen. Before I go to Councilmember Mahan, I just wanted to ask. Um, there was a draft framework given to the technical advisory committee that include included timelines. Why was that not part of our presentation today? Yes, um, thank you, Chair Foley. It's a great question and it's something that we went back and forth with a bit. How, how could we update you and bring more information to you and yet not put in front of you a draft that seemed to be cooked when we did not feel like we had finished doing outreach on it yet. So really it's because we, we had always intended to do this next piece of public facing outreach outside of our technical advisory and stakeholder advisory groups. And we didn't wanna bring something to you too early that we hadn't had more time to get more fully vetted um, with folks that frankly will be affected by the program out there. So we wanted to wait a little bit longer before putting it in front of you. Okay, I, I can appreciate that, but I'm also, I'm looking at what was sent forwarded to me from one of those members. Sure. And there's a lot of information here that has me uh, questioning the timelines and raising concerns about the legality of some of the timelines. And, and I don't mean as far as eminent domain or a taking, I mean, uh, really to get into the weeds a little bit, a seller puts a prop, it's an investment property, seller puts a property on the market, selling it as a 1031 exchange. They have very specific timelines that they must meet. Buyer comes in, buyer also coming off a 1031 exchange. And for those who are, sorry, I'm in the weeds on this, but this has to do, a 1031 is a tax deferred strategy on how investment property owners can then defer their property or their income taxes to the purchase of another property, another commercial or investment property. So though that's 45 days, that's a 45 day window. And where the legality and the issue is gonna come up is who's giving them the advice on the 45 days and the timelines in the proposal would really restrict those 45 days for both the seller of the property and a potential buyer if a non-qualified buyer can buy the property. So I'm, I'm just throwing it out there as something I am very concerned with when this comes back to us is how we're gonna deal with affecting, negatively affecting people who are selling their property and hope to benefit from a 1031 exchange. These are not people who are trying to not pay taxes. They're delaying paying taxes by buying another property. It's a tax, federal tra tax strategy. So I'll just leave it with that. Um, I could get in the weeds a lot more. You know, I'm the, right. the realtor professional in this five uh, council member committee. So I don't wanna get too far into the weeds. I will uh, defer now to council member Mann. Thank you, Chair. Kristen, did you want to respond to that or should I jump in? Thank you very much. Just really briefly, um, we heard a lot about 1031 exchanges at the start of the process through, especially through our, um, ta our technical advisory committee right. member from Marcus and Millichap, who's been very um, faithful to our process. And um, uh, our understanding is that the 45 days starts when the, at the close of escrow of the selling property. And so it really would, to your point, it might uh, impact reverse 1031 exchanges, but those that are the, where the seller is the one who wants to enter into it, 
they would still have the 45 days from the day that they close escrow on this revised timeline. That would go as normal. I think the question is, is there somebody out there who is selling a different property um, who would be looking at this as a target property or acquisition and therefore they would be under the gun. Right. However, you know, just big picture, our market is so competitive um, that our thought is, is that in a weaker market, that would be a much more concerning thought than in the strong market where, uh, you know, properties generally have multiple offers, not just one. So, so but I, I hear you because we had, and thank you for acknowledging how many details are involved in this. <laughs> um, so we're trying to walk that line with giving background, but not too, too much. No, Knowing that those slides are out there in the public now. Right. And your right. your point is well taken about the seller. It's more the buyer who might right. be the one who benefits from purchasing this property that right. is under the the timeline uh, time crunch as it relates to an exchange. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Hi, Kristen. Um, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for the update and a um, lot, lot of details here. I, I appreciate the, the intention of the potential program. And, and I know we, we're all looking for solutions to our housing crisis. So I, I think the, the debates really, or the discussions really around which, which of these solutions are gonna be most effective and balance the, the, the different needs and interests in the community. And I, I still have a number of questions and, and some concerns about whether or not COPA actually hits that bar. Um, so just on the question of outreach, just since we've talked a lot there, I just want to get a little more specific. I, I appreciate the calendar with all the outreach steps and all the planned outreach, but um, can you just give us a sense of the, the I, I know you haven't proposed an exact scope of the program, but how many property owners roughly, or you know, order of magnitude, how many property owners would, would fall under a COPA program roughly and thus far, how many have been made aware of this program or how many have we attempted to reach out to? Oh, good yeah, thanks for that. That's a kind of a chicken and egg question um, because sure. we haven't officially proposed what the exemptions would be. Um, so, but to your point, we should probably do estimates that if we bring back, you know, as we bring back a recommendation and as we go to the public, we should have that number ready and if there are any options laid out what those numbers would look like right right so, are, are we, yeah i don't know a ton about this but are we i know we implemented a re registry is that a vehicle for contact information that could be utilized for outreach yeah that's a very good point and um you know one yeah i have to say that one of the things that we've been made aware of is that um folks who are listed on the rent registry uh, do not want to be contacted except about the programs that they are being regulated for. And so, um, and so the city has put together more strict guidelines about reaching out to the public and using e-blast lists from different departments for different oh. reasons. And so that's part of what's constraining us because we've gotten complaints that folks are like, oh, I'm getting spammed. And I never signed up for that list. And so, I, yeah. Yeah. so I, I hesitate to use the members, yeah. but I agree that that would be an awesome outreach list if someone would let me do that. Yeah, well, I would really, I, I mean, I'm happy to follow up offline. We can continue that conversation. I, I would really encourage us to strongly consider doing that just because this is a case where we're discussing proposed regulation that would directly impact everyone on that list. I suspect they would want to know and have the opportunity to weigh in before anything gets decided. Um, I will follow up on that. Okay, thank you. And then on the on the report itself, I was I was surprised after the amount of you, you've obviously thus far had a number of meetings, a lot of technical discussion, a lot of complicated components to this potential program. I didn't see in the report a breakdown of pros and cons or trade-offs or, you know, I always like to look at what are the unintended consequences? What are the potential risks or downsides? I didn't really see an articulation of the concerns, many of which I, I heard reflected in the, the numerous public comments today. 
I assume you've captured that list, but is there a reason that as, as a committee or as council members, we're not yet seeing the feedback you're getting, both positive and negative, and kind of how you're attempting to address it? It just, it felt like the memo was a little bit, I don't mean this in a, it, it was a little bit of a pitch for the program, it sounded like, and, and I understand there's a rationale. I think it's totally fair to lay out the rationale, but I think it would be, be great to bring in some balance of, well, what, what else are we hearing? What are the areas of concern that we're trying to resolve as well? Yeah, thank you, council member. The, um, that's exactly what we're trying to figure out how to lay out with the main memo. And one of our thoughts was, if you start talking pros and cons on more specifics, then really it leads you to the discussion of a proposal. Um, when we didn't feel like we were quite ready to have that discussion at committee yet, but that's exactly what you'll see when we come back, which is here's the element, here's, you know, here's some information, here's what people say pro and con. And so it's, it's um, so you can kind of narrate your way through like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Okay. With a balanced perspective. I would love to see that balance. I think it would be really helpful to understand what are the, what are the frequently asked questions we're getting? What are the biggest uh, concerns or barriers that are, that are being raised? And, and how are you thinking about those? I, th I think at that level of transparency would certainly help us make an informed decision. Um, and, and, and that leads to another question I had about the status update. And um, you know, I think we're, I guess I'd like to better understand the exact problem we're trying to solve. I understand displacement, this, is, this falls under a broader set of anti-displacement strategies. And I, I get it at that, at the 30,000 foot level, that makes sense to me. But when, when we get down into some of the details here, um, a couple of member, uh, public speakers today referenced market rate conversion. So uh, my understanding is what they're referring to are, are rent controlled apartments that are apartments flying under the apartment rental ordinance that are, that are being converted to market rate upon sale. I didn't see any data in the memo, but do we know how many units a year that approximately that fall into that category? You mean that that, that I, I take that to mean Ellis Act conversion? Yeah, correct. I think that that's my understanding. Yes. I think so. Yeah. Um, I don't have that data handy but we could include that um, if you're interested. Um, well, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm trying to diagnose. Not quite the yeah, sorry, go ahead. attack. No, that's okay. Um, the problem we're trying to get at with this program, and, and again, I just want to say like no one program is going to solve all kinds of problems and all kinds of challenges, but we think that COPA could lay the groundwork that other programs could build on, like a home ownership strategy. We want to make COPA compatible so that home ownership strategies can be used with these buildings, for instance. But um, to that point, what we're what we want to prevent is to have um, profit motivated out of town investors, for instance, that were commonly purchasing large numbers of single family homes in the last economic downturn, um, purchasing especially smaller properties here, um, some larger, but, and have that be kind of a, an increasing element in our market um, rather than, and, and so therefore someone said, if the properties are rent control, they can't really raise rents. Um, well, they can raise rents, and if they reposition the property or do capital improvements, they can petition to raise more than 5%. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is living kind of hand to mouth already, and someone comes through and says, I'm going to reposition the building, I'm going to do all these upgrades, I'm going to therefore be able to charge more rents, rent control building, could they could absolutely petition to charge more than 5% increase. So they could the resident could get a six, seven, or eight percent increase, for instance, and um, that is very destabilizing when you are in a fixed income. So, so th that's the kind of um, destabilizing event that we're trying to get ahead of. And the reason for the timeline being a little on the aggressive side is because we feel like, um, from what we're seeing, that this is a very opportune time for properties to start to trade more. And we can see in the data that the class 
somewhat B, but C properties are the ones that folks are going after now. It's not the class A high rent properties. It's the other sectors, the lower rent sectors. And so that data is bearing out our concern that we've got to get this in place sooner rather than later, especially if we have a, a period before it takes effect, mm -hmm. just because there'll be opportunities for folks to sell their buildings and then who's going to be buying them and what's going to happen with the rents. So that's really what we're trying to get at, getting the more properties in the hands of nonprofits that will work with the city over time to keep restricted affordable units affordable in perpetuity. Right, right. Okay, well, thanks yeah. for the example. And I, I, I think I understand the high level of 10. I'm, I'm just trying to, so, so on one side of the equation, it would be helpful to know how many units per year in San Jose through these different mechanisms, such as a repositioning or an Ellis Act conversion, how many units per year through these different mechanisms do we see being converted from being affordable to being less affordable? Where the, where the rent's going up more than the 5%, cap plus CPI. So that, that would be just kind of understanding that the analysis we're doing to quantify that, that fear that we have that a lot of affordable units are converting into being unaffordable. I, I know, I've heard anecdotal evidence. I would love to see data. That would just be helpful and it would help me understand how um, compelling this solution is. And then on the other side of the equation, I guess, is what is the capacity out there of the nonprofit sector and whatever funding sources we've identified to have a meaningful impact on that market trend. So I guess, on, let me ask on that side of the equation, do we know, is this a solution that has scalability? Is this something that could really address that trend that you're putting? So I guess point one is we're pointing to a concerning trend, but I haven't seen the data to help me understand what the trend is and, or how big it is. And then two, do we have evidence or do we believe that we're actually able to address that trend through this kind of program? Notes while you're talking, sorry. Um, so the question of nonprofits, the nonprofit, the affordable housing development sector and the nonprofits who are in that really to deal with that trend, those are the folks that would be the initial pre-qualified entities under the program. Um, and you know, long term, we're hoping that more uh, community-based nonprofits want to learn and grow their capacity to participate in, in opportunities like that. So, in other markets, you know, this is like our first preservation strategy, if you will. I think it's really the first um, coming forward. We haven't built that that system yet here. However, in other markets, there's absolutely a system going where there are hundreds of units a year getting preserved. It's not thousands. It's not a major, major swath of the sector, but it is small and steady in neighborhoods that are experiencing displacement. And so- I actually ask you about that. Thank you. So what, what would you point to? I would actually be really curious to do more research on this. What would you point to as the most successful program of this nature out there? Which city has gotten this right? Well, and you know, there, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to ask Easton to weigh in on this because he's our expert at looking at other cities. But I will say that we've been looking most at the San Francisco example. And there are many um, communities, as you can see in the memo, that are considering this type of program and states as well as municipalities. But um, right, but uh, the ones we Easton, can learn from. I'm just curious. So San Francisco, how many units a year have they been able to protect from being converted to a more expensive, less affordable unit? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm going to uh, go at it a couple of different ways. Uh, but just a, the basic answer is between 140 and 150 units are currently being preserved under the small site acquisition program. So COPA has been in effect for about just about two years, and of course there, that was COPA. I'm oh, sorry, that was COVID impacted, um, and so the scale of the COPA program obviously is still currently being uh, built. Uh, but really, the scale is really matched by the amount of commitment of resources by the city and by the infrastructure of qualified nonprofits that already exist in your city. Um, so the amount of commitment, as far as resources is concerned, from um, San Francisco is pretty significant. 
uh, and they have had already a pretty pretty robust preservation program, which I think really helps move properties off the table. But I want to add another thing, which is that it's not so, solely 150 units per year that are going through this small site uh, the small site program. The idea is that it's targeted in areas where there is the most amount of uh, displacement happening. So the denominator actually changes when you're thinking about where you're actually focusing these resources and places where displacement is actually happening at places where obviously we were talking about a little bit earlier, there's the most amount of upside when you're thinking about repositioning. The other thing I was gonna say is that in uh, Washington DC, um, the program has been around since 1980, uh, about 40 years, but it really didn't really start scaling until the, again, the, the, the local government started really putting some resources towards helping to finance some of these purchases and moving them off the market. Um, since 2015, there's been about 1,500 units that have been taken off the market. From my understanding, right now, they're trying to scale up to about 500, between 500 and 1,000 units per year. But again, that's that's a future plan uh, because obviously there's been a lot of displacement pressures in the district in the past 10 years, as you probably have seen from the recent census numbers. Again, I think the question really is um, not only on the front side, and to go back to Kristen's point about uh, chicken and egg problem, is that what COPA does is really help you sort of start the process, um, but really there needs to be an ecosystem in place, both from the qualified nonprofits, but also from the city's commitment and resources to be able to take those properties off the market and to be able to reach the scale that you're having a serious impact in those areas that are experiencing the most amount of displacement. Right, and that's, thank you, Asen. And that, I have to say, the availability of a regular amount of funds um, was one of the key issues that um, several of our stakeholders brought up early on as really important in like, how do we know that an offer would be um, a valid offer? How do we know that these guys can get any financing whatsoever? Right. And if it's dependent on city financing, are you gonna do something regularly? Like all of this kind of folds together. And as Asen said, you know, this is kind of the first step um, in getting out there a, an opportunity and a different process. And at the same time, we need to increase the number of participants, the number of nonprofits that want to play in the preservation sector here and our ability to put out the subsidy that makes housing affordable for, that, for preservation in addition to new construction. They're, they're solving different things. Okay, thanks. So, so what I'm hearing is that the, the single biggest limitation right now seems to be the level of number of nonprofits in the ecosystem that will purchase these kinds of properties and then the resources they have. And I guess I'm wondering why we aren't starting with a focus on helping nonprofits that want to do this, simply access the resources and the professional services, the realtors, to be competitive in, there, there are many properties up for sale at any given time. Right. Prior to setting up a program that might have a lot of overhead and a lot of regulatory burden on property owners, why, why are we not starting by trying to empower nonprofits to go do this and kind of run that experiment to see how effective they are? Right. I, I think, um, I think that you can start in either place. And when we ask that question actually of communities that have done preservation actively, like San Mateo County, like Oakland, like Richmond, we've been in this learning cohort from other Bay Area cities. Um, and you know, this is a similar question that the other communities that are pursuing COPA in the Bay Area have also grappled with. There goes my office light again. Uh, uh, you know, which is Redwood City, um, East Palo Alto. I think Redwood City's put it on hold right now, but because they're doing some other things. East Palo Alto, Oakland, Berkeley, they're all looking at and putting forward COPA proposals. Um, the, you can start with the COPA or you could start with the money. But really when we've talked to affordable housing developers, they were like, is it worth my while to develop or iterate my business line to be in your market and and you know is it worth it to me because this isn't that easy of a business and so uh, I need to understand what I'd be getting into and 
are you going to support that financially? So, um, you know, so you can start in either place. We started with this because, um, you know, frankly, coming with forward with an ask for lots of money with no vehicle by which they could actually get an opportunity and greater insight into the properties that are up for sale seemed a little futile. And I, that is not to say, I just want to make it clear, the nonprofit developers that we regularly work with use brokers, right? That is already the case. So it's not like they don't use realtors, don't use brokers. But if a property is selling within a particular brokerage, they're still not going to have insight into that property going up for sale unless they happen to be working with a broker, broker from that brokerage, right? So with yeah, that yeah. number trading off market, the limit, you know, you're still limited. I wanted to ask you about the off market piece. That seems like a big component or big barrier here to, to what we're trying to achieve. Um, did, did you look at other mechanisms for increasing transparency in the market? It, it seems like we sort of have a, a question of a potential market failure here. And I'm wondering if there's just a, whether it's better empowering nonprofits with funds and professional services, or it's some other mechanism. What, what can we do to address if, if that's the, the biggest barrier? I guess what I'm trying to, to back up for a moment, part of what I'm trying to wrap my head around here is, why we don't see nonprofits doing this and kind of the actual mechanics here of, of what the barrier is. It sounds like it's funding, but it may also be the fact that many of these properties are off market. So do we look at other ways of improving the transparency of the marketplace? Yeah, that's a good question. And then I'm gonna ask um, my colleague, Josh Ishimatsu to comment on this. Josh is an affordable, um, a community-based affordable housing developer for many years in the LA area. Um, so, you know, our goal was not to do a big transparency initiative. Our goal was really to get some more restricted affordable housing in perpetuity, right? So we're not like the Department of, of Real Estate for the state. They might do a transparency initiative. We are really trying to figure out how do we get more properties that will work with us ongoing to extend affordability restrictions and make sure that there are no problems on their property, like that we get to go talk to them in case we hear there are problems like with folks on the property. And then we have a, you know, we have a leg in that standing to, to go and try to solve that problem. Um, with smaller properties in general, uh, it tends to be locally based, community focused nonprofits that care about their community care about the residents in their community that want to do this, frankly, harder work with small buildings. And so I wanted to ask Josh for a quick comment as to the types of community-based um, preservation that you've seen or been part of. Josh, is on mute. There you go. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, when I work with the community-based um, developer in Los Angeles, you know, we did a variety of different um, apartment buildings, you know, from six units to, uh, you know, to six units to 60 units, uh, rehab, you know, acquisition rehab projects. Um, and, you know, we, we assembled properties into, into, um, we would buy some, several smaller properties and assemble them into one larger property so that we could be tax credit eligible. Um, and put together projects that way. Um, but like Kristen says, you know, it's, it's like, it's actually harder work, you know, than, than just buying a vacant lot and, um, you know, and, you know, figuring out how much you can build on that lot and, and just building whatever, you know, whatever the, um, to, to the maximum the entitlements would let you. Um, so, you know, it tends to be like a, a certain type of developer. And in San Francisco, you know, it's, it's the, the developers that are taking advantage of COPA are mostly these um, community-based uh, nonprofit developers as well. Um, so, you know, I think that's, that's, that's something that would be really important to, to build out in, in San Jose as well, you know, to build up this, this um, community-based development e ecosystem. Um, and, you know, this would be, COPA would be one 
piece of it, but there'd be no other pieces that are necessary to it. Right, Thanks. we're one of the only communities that don't have community development corporations and it's very strange. I don't, I don't really get why. We're number 10 in the country and we're lagging. So I, I guess from, thanks Josh, I think from my perspective, it would be helpful to then understand which pieces, sort of what the expected impact is and which pieces are necessary. I'm, I'm, I have concerns about the regulatory burden we'd be adding with this program, but part of what I think I'm hearing is this is really not sufficient. We'd have to do a bunch of other things. So I'd love to know what's the, what are all the other things we have to do? And I'm sure they're in our anti-displacement strategy, but I, I, I would, I, mean, it, I guess the question is with limited staff time, I mean, the, the biggest uh, concern I hear over and over from staff is just how, how limited our bandwidth is. You know, what, what is the straightest path here? And I have to admit, I'm, I'm still not quite hearing, and maybe I just need to talk to some of the nonprofits out in the marketplace and would, would welcome any referrals you might have. I, I'm not really clear on why, um, the city basically helping to identify funding and professional services for those nonprofits would not solve the problem. Is, is it just that we think that there aren't enough properties available on the market for them to identify even with a professional realtor? So I just wanna clarify when we're talking about nonprofits that would qualify as a qualified buyer, we're talking about entities like Eden Housing, like Midpen Housing, um, like hip housing on the peninsula, um, you know, so the old reputable companies who know how to do acquisition development and rehab. So they're so, pretty sophisticated already. Oh, they're very sophisticated right. already. Um, uh, when we're talking about our community partners as part of this program, we're talking about um, folks like, actually talk about sophisticated, Somos Mayfair is a extremely sophisticated community yep. partner with a lot of growth potential. And if Somos wanted to, you know, augment their skills, um, actually one of the things that we're trying to work on is um, figuring out how to access outside resources and put together a curriculum. Josh has also got a, 10 years of experience on how to capacity build with community-based nonprofits. Um, so he's perfect for this work. Um, how do we pull together resources and try to you know, focused um, work and, and then trying to, you know, be targeted about the nonprofits that we help in our community on the community partner side, because we need both. We don't just want out of town developers coming in, right? It needs to be both. So to your point, we, we need the entities interested in doing this work and the capacity for them to, you know, the knowledge to do this work and the experience and track record Right, have a, having done acquisition rehabs before, and, the and then we need city funding because that's the key to the yep. execution. So that sounds great. I'm following all of that. What I'm not following is why then they also need a first right of offer and a first right of refusal. I, if, yeah. if we build capacity and we help them identify funding, and they have a professional you. realtor, and we're increasing mm -hmm. market competitiveness and transparency. Why do we also need extra layers of regulation actually slowing down market transactions and creating more overhead for small property owners? Yeah, I've been thinking about this. And I, I think that the reason that this is hard in San Jose is the same reason that we need this in San Jose, which is the market is fast, right? And it is very common. It's common for properties to get lots of interest when they put the property on the market. So when you're seeing buildings that are, you know, bigger buildings, say 50 unit buildings, and they're taking how many days, Josh and Asen, to close, that doesn't mean they didn't get interest quickly, right? And so the question is, how do we create a more equitable playing field in ways that will help residents here who are vulnerable? of displacement in a way that just allows um, an offer to be considered without the noise of, I don't know, am I getting four other offers today? And just lets, you know, kind of a quiet moment for someone to consider, is this offer fair? And should I move forward with these folks? Or not, that's it. It's a small pause in the process. It is not a big 
a big lengthy um, ask that we are going towards. So that's what we're going, that's what we're, that's what we think will help. That's what reportedly from other cities, apparently it does help. Okay. I, I mean, I'd certainly like to continue to dig into and understand that. I, I guess my question would be with, with the capacity building, with the capacity building that we could offer and Josh's expertise and the professional services, we could, we could help a community-based group link up with, I would imagine they could be positioned to put in an offer as quickly as, as an individual who might also be in that market, who's competing, maybe on the really big ones, maybe I'm missing something, but um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm still not quite understanding why the nonprofit buyers are fundamentally different than other market participants, many of which are not huge corporations, but are also individuals uh, who have a realtor. And so I'm, I'm just, especially on those smaller properties, it seems like maintaining a dynamic and flexible market. I, I guess the other point here is that ultimately the property owner has the, the ultimate right to decide which offer is best, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And even with a right um, of um, there's the first offer and then the first refusal, even then, even if a nonprofit buyer who we've empowered, hopefully in this marketplace makes a comparable offer, I, I assume it's still going to be up to the interpretation of the property owner. Even if the dollar value is the same, there are a lot of other terms in contracts. So, so do they still ultimately get to decide? Yeah, we've been talking about that with Tim and Anil and other members of the work group that we need to come up with a definition of what constitutes an offer. And while, you know, there might be 10 different aspects to an offer or eight, what are the critical ones that, that are material that would have to be matched? It might not be every last one, but the material ones would need to be matched. Yeah, I'll be interested. That's an important point. I appreciate you mentioning that. I'll be interested to see how that evolves. Having done a lot of business contracts in my past career, <laughs> hundreds of them, uh, every every term matters, and and you kind of put a price on all the terms. You know, the reps and warrants and the various components of a contract, and you kind of price out risk. And I, I would be nervous if we came in and tried to say with one size fits all as a city, these are the five terms that matter, and and we're not going to let you weigh anything else here in the, I would just be very nervous about us getting into the contract uh, dynamics and trying to determine which elements of a contract matter and which don't. But I appreciate you highlighting that as an area of further exploration. Um, I have many more questions, but I feel like I've been talking a lot. Uh, Chair, do you wanna interject or allow someone else to speak? Council member, I'm hoping to wrap this up because we're gonna start losing council members. So I, may I Listen, suggest that you line. sit down with Kristen and uh, go over a briefing with her on your thousands okay. of additional questions that you may have. <laughs> yes. That's going to be our off, pleasure. But... <laughs> yes. And, uh, this isn't our first conversation, but absolutely. Thank you. Thank <laughs> Great. You. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, Kristen, I have a lot of questions too, but I'm I'm uh, sensitive to the time and, and would love to sit down with you because some of this is uh, sort of the details of it that I'd, I'd love to discuss with you. Uh, I appreciate Council Member Mann's uh, line of questioning and I had some, uh, some very similar questions too. Mm -hmm. I, I think preserving real estate is a good idea, uh, being competitive in bidding on real estate, I think there is a little bit of a, a misconception that there are these multiple offers that are occurring on investment properties that may or may not be occurring. We hear, mm -hmm. we know that happens on single family homes, uh, but we don't know. I, I think that is less true in the fourplex and above market or even in the duplex market. So it, it it's, and a, an offer is, it, you know, you put a property on the market, you hope you get one offer that your seller's going to accept and it has the terms and, and price that everybody's willing to move forward with. And that, you know, that's kind of what is part of the devil in, in the, the details of this. So I'd love to sit down with you, Kristen, and uh, talk to you more about uh, what a qualified uh, nonprofit is, where their financing is coming from, what's the city's commitment, those kind of things, uh, timing, uh, and and just get a, a a better sense of 
what where this is going. But what I'd like to know, you you mentioned something that um, had me a little concerned, and I just want to clarify it a little bit. And that is, uh, you had mentioned that we want to bring this to city council, and then we'll work out some of the details later. Did I misunderstand that? Because I, I or I really feel we should work out the details before city council takes a little look at it. What what's I, what's your thought yeah. process in there? I think that we're going to work out most details in the course of the council's approval. Um, the ordinance will be spare as usual, very short relative to the details and that the program documents and exactly how they're worded and written, I think will be the um, the art right or the area of comments after that. So I, I think that we'll end up honing a more details at that time. But I agree that it's it's been hard to even have conversations without understanding all the details up front. And so that most of the details will be tackled kind of up front as we bring the whole program concept to you. Okay. Because I, I think that is really important. And I think if we move forward with a program like, like this, we have to get it right. I know Berkeley took a look at it and they didn't go forward with it, which is interesting to me. So I'd like to dig into, I just learned that today. So I'd like to dig into why oh, yeah. that was. They're still pending. They're still definitely planning That's to go pending. forward. The, the mayor is, I think, determining when. Okay. That, yeah. that, That's that what makes we hear. Sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So I'll, I'll schedule something with you, but I'd also That's like great. you to consider moving our timeline back to post holidays. Uh, I'm very mindful that this is the first holidays that many people will actually be able to celebrate and, and it's the time to um, maybe give them a break. So they may not wanna come to these meetings, especially uh, property owners. Uh, and, and we're really talking about reaching out to, I think, homeowners, real estate owners, uh, not the the, sure, the mon pod landowners and, and the housing providers, but it's really the, the property owners who we need to, to talk to the, you know, uh, John Smith, who owns a duplex and let him know that this is going to happen. And, and then there's uh, one thing I want to hear from you is how we're going to educate our community once this is in the process, because we have realtors or brokers who help who represent buyers who aren't from this area. So how are we going to get the information to make sure they're compliant? And then the, the last thing I'd wanna hear from is what does compliance mean and what does enforcement mean? That's a really important consideration. So so with that, do uh, I'm, I'm gonna finish, but I'll schedule something with you, Kristen. If, you, if you're available, I think that would be really helpful for me to sit down and understand a little bit more. And uh, with that, do any, uh, any of my other council colleagues have uh, questions? If not, why don't we vote to accept the report? And again, thank you, Kristen, for your report. Asen and Joshua, thank you as well. And thank you to the community for being here and offering your input. It is really important and I make, I always listen to all of the comments and I make notes on all of the comments as well. So I have several you know, like 10 pages of, doc, of notes that uh, accompanied your statements. So with that, is there, uh, we have a motion, we have a second, let's vote. Carrasco? Carrasco? Aye. Perales? Yes. Mayhem? Aye. Esparza? Esparza? Yes. Did yes. that come through? Yes. It yes. Did. Fully. Aye. Thank you. Great. Thank. Thank you so much. Whoops. Muted myself. <laughs> Thank you for uh, the really good questioning uh, from Councilmember Perales and Councilmember Mayhan. I appreciate the the insight. Very helpful. And Kristen, thank you so much for your passion and and um, commitment. Uh, all right, with that, we're finished with the formal agenda. Uh, now it is time for public comment.
I think I have one hand raised. Two hands raised. Tessa Woodmancy. Thank you very much. Well, you know, this um, meeting is on community, and that's what I'm looking at is community development. You know, that's what we really need to be looking at and focusing on as we are dealing with the crises as we experienced last night. And, you know, the, this, is what, this is what climate change looks like. And um, so what we have to do is prepare ourselves to be resilient. And that in, includes, and what we did with even our city resiliency fund and then the, the state and the federal funds that are coming in for resiliency and HERO and all this, it has to be focused on uh, the green economy. And when we, you know, celebrate that there's a Dunkin' Donut, how, how green is the Dunkin' Donuts? You know, that's what we have to be looking at. And so what I'm saying is that we need to be supporting the green economy. And that's where only 2% of the federal funds went to the green economy. So this is where we need to make this transformational change. And it is about, and, and that's what I say, you know, with Allery Middlebrook, I mean, she's got a nonprofit, a small, and she's been a small business owner. And her whole thrust is to build um, 25 by 25, build eco villages. And this is what we need to start supporting and building our housing and our, you know, the companion food. And that, that we, and she says that we can support growing enough food right here in San Jose. And we need to do that. We need to, you know, have a transformational unifying experience to really see if we can do that as we go forward. So that, that's just something that we need to be focused on is buying lands to, and to really put our money where our mouth is literally to grow food locally. And that needs to be, you know, to even have a future we need to think about how we can go ahead and do that and get off of fossil fuels. Is, and these are jobs that she's creating for the, and training that we would do for the homeless to create jobs, to, to grow food and to um, make our you know, earth a garden, make uh, our neighborhoods a garden again for all of ourselves. And Thank you. Next caller, Blair Beekman. Hi, this is Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the meeting today. I learned a lot. Um, I thought this COPA things was kind of heading down, you know, middle class street and middle road street, uh, middle of the road street. This is really interesting stuff, what it can do. I'm hoping it can be a good example how we can build the future of our, our free market economy practices based on these good examples. Uh, thanks for this item. Uh, I, I, you know, I think I'm going to change my name to Mr. Magoo because <laughs> I, I try and I, I'm just, I'm not quite there, but yet I can do something kind of nice. And so um, to deal, to, a, to ask about, uh, there's an upcoming memo in rules and open government that's going, Chappie Jones and, and, and Sergio Jimenez are asking to pretty much end the city charter process at the end of the year. I'm hoping there can be ways to at least uh, consider a study process uh, and a connection of issues around affordable housing uh, through early the early spring. I think to have that sort of steady and focus for a few more months can can prepare the future of the equity roundtable and the COVID uh, economic forum and the uh, reimagined task force. It can be good examples for that, I think. And, and, and we'd be focused with good examples of, of what that can do. Uh, you know, the, the memo from, from Vice Mayor uh, and, and Sergio Jimenez makes a point. Uh, I just hope we can, you know, explore the idea of, uh, of extending a study process, if nothing else. And um, with that said, the, the subcommittee process was a really difficult situation for us at the city charter because of the events of the VTA. And uh, at that time, everybody closed up massively. And uh, you know, it, it's a time we can start to open up and, and ask what can be a good public process for the subcommittee process as there are these three important commission meetings I've spoken about that are gonna be coming up soon. Let's make the subcommittee open. Thank you. Next caller is Olivia Ortiz. Hello everyone. My name is Olivia Ortiz. I am part of a Vecinos Activos, it's an organizing group that we're organizing um, around housing. Uh, we were doing uh, organizing for around four years regarding uh, displacement. I um, want to thank you guys for moving this program, COPA, forward. I think it's something that we, is much needed here in our neighborhood, especially in the most impacted areas like the east side. 
I live in the Mayfair community and I see the need of housing every single day. I know families, friends that have been pushed out of San Jose and uh, they, they have caused them a lot of trauma about that, especially around our kids. So I really appreciate that you guys move it so, but also uh, doing a little more research about this. Uh, we have been, you know, talking out there with the community. We have been, you know, kind of educating people around what COPA is. It's something that is going to um, benefit our community a lot. So I really um, um, encourage you guys to uh, to keep uh, moving forward and also um, keep community engaged, but not just, you know, um, landlords, not just uh, 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 farm associates, but also community that is most impacted, which is uh, low income community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Olivia. Last caller is Carlos and Denise Padilla. Hi, Pam and team. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, and listening to us. And this is a, a great opportunity for all of us to hear a little bit more and learn more about COPA. I unfortunately was not aware of COPA and, and uh, was only reached out to just in the recent last couple of months. I didn't had no idea that the city council or the housing department was working on this since April of this year. Um, I agree with everyone that we need more housing and housing at lower cost, but COPA does not solve either of these problems. This is a first right uh, to purchase and is a big deal. This is not to be taken lightly. It's a new concept. It's not normal. It's not free market. We should not give anyone first and especially not last right for giving people uh, we're, we're talking about completely changing the system, and if we proceed, it will negatively impact middle class and small business owners and, and investors the most. You, uh, we, there is already talk about the, the nonprofits that were being discussed are, are larger nonprofits, basically government entities or government subsidized entities. If the government and their nonprofits would like to buy, buy properties, then they can and should, but they should do, do it through the normal process, work with real estate companies, brokers, follow the system that exists. We should not make the city of San Jose an, an experiment that will likely go bad and will have negative results along with many frustrated property owners and business owners. I think we should really just take two steps back, uh, like Matt and Pam and many of others have have asked. You know, let's let's look at what the problems is and the solutions because I think there's a lot of speculations about problems that don't exist. The large properties, large apartment buildings are not highly sought after. It's not as competitive as people are saying, especially when you get to the larger units, which is where you'll get the most bang for your buck. It would be a lot easier for them to just follow the normal system. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Next caller, Vecino Activos. Hi, my name is Maria Guerrero. I'm part of Vecinos Activos with Somos Mayfair. And honestly, I think we should do a lot more talking with the community, not just homeowners, but the renters, or renters that are living in here that are impacted by a lot of what's going on. I have walked, worked with community for years and I've heard stories of them being displaced and moving to other count, like counties, states, because they can't stay here. And our system, you know, our system's broken right now. We need to fix that. We need to make sure that our community is actually being able to stay here, to stay as our community and not be displaced. That was the whole purpose of this, to make sure that our community is not leaving San Jose to make sure that children, families, people in general are not being houseless. And I think COPA is going to help, is a tool to help that displacement. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we are adjourned. Have a good evening. <laughs>